three. Just say when, huh? Hi, hello, friends. Welcome to the Sonal Holland Wine Academy Knowledge Summit powered by Shazay. This is the first ever virtual summit being organized in India uh, on wines and is being organized over two consecutive days, that is today and tomorrow. If the year 2020 was all about survival, the year 2021 is of new learnings and new beginnings. The digital world has brought us closer than ever before. And keeping this opportunity in mind, we wanted to create a knowledge platform for wine enthusiasts, industry professionals, students of hospitality, and so many other, you know, the entire community of wine, where we could all come together and learn about the numerous aspects of the wine world. Participation in the summit is entirely free because we really believe good knowledge should be accessible to all. So that's a unique opportunity for you to join us and participate in this unique knowledge sharing platform. This first of its kind event in India will comprise of master classes, panel discussions and engaging sessions led by industry experts and innovators such as winemakers, brand heads, CEOs, educators, all kinds of people who are involved in the business of wine. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Sonal Holland and I am a master of wine. I started Sonal Holland Wine Academy in 2009 with the vision of creating a pool of qualified wine and beverage professionals who had world-class education and they would be fully equipped and competent enough to serve the burgeoning food and beverage industry in India. As a professional, I have personally greatly benefited, not just from learning at stellar educational institutions like the London-based Wine and Spirits Education Trust and the Institute of Masters of Wine, but also I have immensely benefited from learning from knowledgeable people in the global wine trade these are people who have selflessly shared their knowledge and understanding of wines with me and have greatly shaped the person that I am today. One such person that I would like to acknowledge today is Stephen Spurrier, who passed away yesterday. He was 79 years old. And through the span of his long 55-year-long career, he made legendary contributions to the global wine trade. Stephen was one of the most respected and liked persons in the wine trade. And we're all well aware, well aware of his great contribution to the world of wine through his numerous books, journals, articles on wines, tasting notes, and whatnot. He's more famously known for the Judgment of Paris, a watershed blind tasting event that turned some of the most famous French chateaus on their heads and shifted the limelight to look beyond stellar French wines to create some iconic Californian wines uh, brands who now represent the best of what is available in the world. I have personally met Steven Spurrier on a number of occasions. He's always been the most humblest and the kindest of gentlemen and mostly at tastings and dinners where we've had amazing conversations and he's always introduced me so admirably as the master of wine from India because I know that India is a country that he was always very very fond of visiting. He was instrumental in starting several initiatives including the Wine Society of India many years ago and more lately struck a strategic and a fantastic collaboration with Fratelli Vineyards to co-create a blend with their chief winemaker, Piero Masi, and actually lent his initials on the label. Uh, so the MS label of the Fratelli Vineyards, the S represents Spurrier himself. I would like to take a moment of silence in memory of this extraordinary individual whose invaluable contributions will last and serve over several generations, benefiting several professionals such as you and me.
Thank you and welcome back to the Knowledge Summit from Sonal Holland Wine Academy. We have a super, super lineup of speakers for this evening. But before we dive head first, I'd like to acknowledge our partners for the Sonal Holland Wine Academy Knowledge Summit. Our partner is Shaze, which is a luxury and a lifestyle brand that offers elite creations across the hosting and the entertainment space corporate gifting, men and women fashion accessories to home decor creations. Whatever aspirational your heart desires in the home lifestyle and entertainment space, Shaze has got you covered. Do check them out on their website, www.shaze.in. And now for our first panel discussion, where we dive at the deep end of the ocean to discuss how the Indian wine industry can be catapulted to five times its size over the next five years. We have a stellar lineup of speakers for the evening. Uh, let me quickly add our speakers for this evening. So welcome. I'm delighted to introduce our stellar lineup of speakers for this evening. And what better place to start than talk about the Indian wine industry. Everybody is looking to the Indian wine industry and see how we can catapult the growth of the Indian wine industry from where we are today to five times its size, go to 5,000 crores over the next five years. This is a very, very ambitious vision, but I know that this is a, a topic of discussion and something that has been on all of our minds. So we've lined up the most amazing uh, panel of speakers who will speak about this vision today. We have Ravi Vishwanathan, who is the chairperson at Grover Zampa Vineyards, among the leading wine producers of India. We also have Gaurav Sekri, who is the managing director and the co-founder at uh, Fratelli Vineyards, who's also joining us today. Um, and Fratelli, again, Vineyards, again, needs no introduction among the leading and top three uh, wineries in India. And of course, we have Subhash Arora, who is a prolific wine writer, wine judge who travels all around the globe. And if there's a wine tasting competition happening, it's most likely that Subhash Arora will be there. He's been a friend and a colleague for as long as I've been in the industry and well before me. And uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome all three of you on this panel. Thank you for making the time. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. so let me start with asking Ravi. Uh, Ravi, in your opinion, we uh, what what you've been witnessing the Indian wine industry for quite a number of years now. In the in the beginning, more as an investor, uh, and more more lately, you kind of you know you you you've taken it head on 
to as a chairperson with Grover Zampa Vineyards. So you've seen it from a distance. You're seeing it now very closely, and you've been watching this industry grow over the span of the last decade. And we want to know from you what, according to you, are some of the important strides that we have made in the Indian wine industry over the past five years. How far do you think we've come? What have we done right so far, and uh, what remains to be to be done, in your opinion? Well, the, the the obvious answer is that quality has massively improved over the last decade. Uh, over the maybe ten years ago, fifteen years ago, it was easy to criticize Indian wines. Uh, today, uh, major wineries in the country produce wine which are decent by any global standard, and that's evidence in the number of medals we collect in international competitions and. And other things of that nature. So that, that, that's a difficult. And, and there's been a, a significant focus on quality everywhere, which is somewhat different from what happened in the growth in, in the growth of the Chinese wine industry. At the beginning, we never focused on quality. I think India has focused on quality first. Yeah. And I think the people are now starting to appreciate it. Hmm. And that focus on quality has allowed the industry to now have. Uh, a skilled pool of talents. We have winemakers. We don't need. We are not so many uh, imports in terms of human resources in the industry now, compared to what other countries have done in early stages of the wine industry, sure. which were completely dominated by imported uh, talents. In, in India, we have now homegrown talent. We both at viticulture and winemaking level, and the quality has improved. So I think that's a very good. Um, base now the yeah. next step is yeah, we've to established go bigger a quality and standard so, yeah. and we've developed a pool of qualified winemakers and all other yeah. professionals within india so we're able to be atmanirbhar which is what our our government wants us to be correct so yeah and, and if you look at our china or chile or argentina or even australia when they started their wine industry they, it was somewhat different they were focusing more on volume more on entry level wines and uh, to import a lot more of the human resources needed to grow their industry in India we manage for many reasons some of them due to the administrative complications of doing business in India right to put it mildly but we we've, we've managed to grow domestically the talent pool the quality and everything and tropical viticulture is not easy we are one of the rare countries in the world where tropical viticulture yes Yes, and we have some real challenges with climatic, uh, yeah, our own climatic uh, conditions, and and uh, how we cope with that. So yes, absolutely, it's not easy doing. Uh, you know, we've actually defied every single norm that we learn theoretically, where they say some of the best vineyards lie in the latitude of. 30 to 50 degree latitude and we're just too too close to the equator and despite and although we are closest to the equator in the northern hemisphere somehow cyclically we tend to follow the southern hemisphere sort of a pattern of harvesting isn't it yeah. uh, so yeah. we have we, we have our own sort of uniqueness and I, I do have a question for Gaurav but before that I wanted to ask you you touched upon an important point about being self-reliant as far as developing this human resource is concerned but is this something we've had to do or is this been by design and a good thing what I mean to say is do you think we would have benefited better if we had had larger level of investments coming through more flying winemakers coming in from all across the world who would perhaps sure, sure, sure be quality and you know sure it helps but one of the the consequence of having this push for quality over the last decade has been to grow uh, indian stuff to grow the skill set because you cannot produce quality if you don't have skilled people and this emphasis on quality has helped achieve that it could have gone faster if we had uh, 10 times the resources that imported uh, everything but at least it's on growing it and it's a solid base Yes, yes. And sometimes we can't just assume that a, a, an expatriate will fully understand and appreciate the Indian terroir and the challenges mm -hmm. that come with it too. Sometimes, you know, maybe just being local and being homebred or homegrown sort of gives us an innate sense of understanding of what is needed on our on our soils or across our topography and so on, isn't it? Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, and today we objectively Indians are the only ones with 
the in-depth knowledge of tropical agriculture. Nobody else in the world. Right. So, right. So according to you, we've done we've done good work in the areas of quality and developing a pool of uh, you know homegrown talent. But obviously, the challenges that remain ahead of us are how do we circumvent the challenges that the inherently the nature provides that stops us from sort of surging forward and creating. Um, I mean, we have to deal with these climatic problems and, and tropical viticulture challenges. And sometimes maybe that comes in the way of our being a huge voice on the global stage, isn't it? That, that, that's what we're saying. Yeah, but, uh, but if I may say so, in the Indian context, overcoming the challenges of nature is a lot easier than overcoming the challenges of government. Of the government. Okay, great. Yes, I agree. And that's been a lifelong journey for us all. Um, let me quickly ask Gaurav. Gaurav, you have recently, I know you have been involved with Fratelli Vineyards right from the beginning and you've worked very closely with Kapil, um, our dear friend. But more lately, you've been, of course, more closely involved. You've taken charge full on and you're now in the driving seat at Fratelli Vineyards. What I want to ask you, Gaurav, is... As somebody who has experience from other industries as well, right, which are more industrial or more manufacturing, uh, because your family is involved in other businesses as well, which you've been more closely involved with, what sort of a, when you come in with a fresh perspective, um, how do you feel about our industry as, you know, maybe momentarily you can answer this question, even as an outsider, when you step in, how do you feel about this industry? Do you find this too small, too inward thinking? What do you feel we need to be able to surge forward? And what is it that we are doing and not even thinking about yet? So I think, uh, uh, so Sonal, firstly, thank you for inviting me to uh, be part of this, uh, you know, very learned panel to comment, although I'm literally just four months old in, uh, in sort of trying to understand and manage the wine business on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, for uh, you know, when I see the wine industry, to me, the, um, the issue is it's a chicken and egg situation uh, when I see it, you know, with a fresh pair of eyes. Um, to really get, um, uh, you know, get real high quality of anything involved, you need scale. And I think, uh, you know, scale uh, in India is a little bit linked to uh, some of the things which are systemically at fault with this industry, which is what I think Ravi touched on as well. Um, and I think that is what prevents us to, to get true potential of the scale that's possible in this industry. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is just, uh, is just in the hands of the government. Uh, it's easier said than done as to what, what they can fix and how they will fix. Uh, but it is truly in the hands of the government, you know, the, um, uh, I think a lot of my peers in this industry, like us, uh, suffered the brunt of abrupt changes of law, you know, forget about just normal ease of doing business, you know, abrupt changes of law, like that highway order that came a couple of years ago, right? Bars, restaurants, yeah. outlets had to shut if they were X uh, hundred meters just overnight. Yeah. Um, you know, Delhi government allowed uh, uh, you know modern retail outlets uh, uh, the license to sell wine and then suddenly withdraw it uh, yeah. and you know a lot of people got stuck as collateral damage so these are just things which are completely unnecessary mm. uh, aside from the fact that if they make you know the taxation easier availability easier um, you know which are which are you know just so easy uh, to do in a manner, manner you know manner of speaking they've all we've also had to cope with these very very sudden and dramatic changes um, that uh, also come uh, uh, in India. And I think uh, it's only us Indian companies who have the wherewithal to somehow, um, you know, uh, either we are overly religious, etc. We have faith in God and we just kind of believe we take it on the chin and we move on. Many yeah. other companies, if they had the choice or who are not Indian, would throw in the towel and leave. Sure. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with you. Gaurav, I want to just play devil's advocate for a second and ask you a supplementary question to your observations. And I, I really like your point about scale. You know, like we, we, we're unable to achieve the scale we want because of all the erratic government regulatory changes that take place in this country. But I was in conversation with somebody in the trade who was who, who kind of deals more closely with the excise and, you know, the people in the government and so on. And uh, the, the talk was... Completely contrary. I heard this for the first time in my life. Um, I was given to, um, 
you know, we've always blamed the government, right? In, in, and for rightful reasons, we're right in doing so for, for being unhappy. But um, I heard that the government's view up on us or about us is more like the, the there are problems for all Alcobef uh, industries, right? The same sort of uh, taxes exist for whiskey or any any category of spirits or beers and so on. And yet some of these industries have have really grown to a, a massive scale. They've achieved such an amazing scale. India has now suddenly taken to so much beer. Gin is all the rage right now and so on. And the, apparently the government is now looking to us as, and I call us all as one, is looking to us and saying, what is wrong with you wine people? You know, the same rules exist for everybody. Why are you all not being able to move forward? Um, we've tried to do more for the Indian wine industry by relaxing you all and protecting you against the onslaught of imports and so on. Uh, and yet we've not been able to achieve that certain scale. So my, un for the first time I heard this person say to me that the government apparently is looking at us and is also expressing their displeasure at the fact that we've not been able to achieve the scale. So my question, my devil's advocate question is, why is that? And secondly, is more of us better or less of us in the sense, if we have more players in this industry, will we even be more crippling because there'll be more competition and uh, you know, will consumption grow because of that or not grow or will, you know, it lead to a larger consolidation? What is better? Um, do we need more of us or do we need fewer of us? No, I, I think uh, it's, uh, you know, there is no debate on more of us or, or less of us. We just need the whole industry to grow. Uh, you know, whether some players become bigger and larger um, uh, or, or just new people come. In fact, Every time a new person comes, we are new. I mean, uh, relatively speaking, ten years is is not that old in in the in in a wine business. Um, so I think new players are welcome. People come with fresh pair of eyes, fresh ideas. It challenges the existing people, which you know, who maybe have set into some sort of inertia, and it makes everyone do better. So, answer to that specific question is more of us is better. And so the more the merrier. And you don't think the that more the merrier more competition and you know sort of uh, and 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 uh, you i mean how do you even control that i mean and one one should not and and uh, one cannot uh, but the wine is a very different business compared to a lot of other alcohol businesses here you um, you know spend about 3 years just getting good quality grapes to be able to harvest and then produce wine um, you know the, the uh, all the other spirits that you mentioned i mean gin uh, I mean, uh, one could probably, s from starting of, of an idea to having something out is probably four months, right? Uh, yes. you, you, can, you can have the product out. Microbreweries, people are putting all around. Um, distilling is not, is not that, um, uh, you know, the time gestation period isn't a problem. In yeah. wine, the issue is the barrier of time mm. in order to make good quality wine. And I think uh, because there has been just uh, no money in the business and, and you only need to see, uh, you know, um, uh, how the businesses have done financially to know that there is very little to no money in this business. And it's very tough for small players, I think, who tend to remain just regional. Um, yeah. It's even more difficult for them. Um, mm. uh, because of that, you know, new vineyards don't come up, new investments don't come up. Um, and you have this problem then, which eventually starts reflecting on quality. Um, so, so, you know, that is the issue here, which you need, you need to unshackle this industry. Uh, yes. You cannot, the comparison to other Alcobeb uh, is not really fair, in my view. Fair. It's not a fair comparison. Fair enough. But, but the word money caught my attention. So I have a question on money, but I'll come back to you later. So, Bash, I do want to um, uh, ask you, uh, you know, you and I know we, we travel a lot. We go overseas in the overseas markets. And uh, many times people don't even know India makes wines. Uh, and I know you are as much an ambassador in constantly promoting the Indian wine industry and so on. So here's my counter view. At one end, we say that we need the West to appreciate our wines. And so the more they appreciate our wines, the, the better our own Indians start to appreciate its own product. You know, like we need an endorsement from the West before we start endorsing our own products and start feeling proud of it. But at the counter view, you know, and I know, Subhash, when we talk to winemakers or, or Indian wine producers, 
they are more focused on domestic consumption given that we're such a large country base and there's so much opportunity here and so exports somewhere takes a bit of a back seat and ends up being more like a prestige thing rather than an area of attention what are your views about this how much role do you think exports or positioning of wines in the international scene can play towards this growth story that we're trying to achieve uh, over the next five years how important do you think that is and why uh, uh, your uh, comments encapsulates what uh, ravi started saying initially uh, and i've been saying it for the last 20 years always that export is absolutely essential to improve the quality for the very simple reason that uh, people outside of India are more appreciative or more understanding of wine than we have been. We would drink whatever we get. And this is where we kind of went wrong in the first 15 years or so. Right after Indich came, they kept on giving us the crap and we kept on drinking it. They kept on importing bulk wine, bottling it and selling it. And we are thinking that, okay, we are having great wines. But uh, at the end of the day, the exports is where the benchmark does come in because that industry has been mature over the century. Wine is not something which happens overnight. And as Gaurav rightly said, we, and, and, and in a, a comment to your, your comment about the government official, the problem is right here that we think of wine as an Alcobev product. Hmm. And I, honestly speaking, don't even consider it Alcobev product. I always say that wine is not alcohol. It has some, but it's not a alcoholic product. Europe, uh, to me, an alcoholic product is when you get, get to get drunk and wine is not that. It's a lifestyle product. It's a food product. And the government has to appreciate the fact that we are about uh, a, a, a different product. Than, and like Gaurav rightly said, that you the, have these products uh, three or four months down the line and you're ready with it. And wine... If you store, you know, like I remember in days they used to say that, oh, we got liquid gold lying in our tanks. In, in the late 90s, uh, Sham Ch Chogla used to say that we have gold in our tanks and the gold is worth nothing after a few years un unless, you know, you, you drink it uh, or you bottle it and drink it. So, so therefore, you know, I think uh, we, we need to, uh, uh, the quality has come up. And, and, and Ravi did mention the last 10 years, it is absolutely a fact now. But we also know that before that, it was not that great because we had a whole lot of farmers, uh, you know, who thought, wow, you know, we, we grow grapes, we will ferment the wine. And uh, that's the thing where you make 300, 400, 500 percent margin and, and we are fine. But that's where the quality did not work. And it's a small producer, if you ask me, you, you talked to Fratelli. Now, I think the reason uh, for the success of Fratelli has been that they were very outward looking. And whatever they've done, the products that they came up with and the amount uh, uh, Kapil worked hard. And initially we were working with Italians and the winemaker was Italian. So all those things helped them look outward. And you saw that the quality came up much faster. Uh, than uh, other producers. Uh, of course, uh, Sula was small when he was making good wine. You know, the Sauvignon Blanc uh, of 1999 is still something that's talked about, you know, and they made only a few thousand cases. So I think the bigger numbers are important for us because you talked about the 5,000 crore, you know, uh, to how to take the 5,000 crore. And that is not going to happen with these players, obviously. So you need to have more players in any case, apart from other things, the problem that we can discuss. But you have to have more players in the game in order to improve the quality. And that will happen only if you are export oriented. I mean, look at uh, Grover. Grover has been exporting wine to France for 20, 25 years. But Thelly is already there in so many countries. Sula has been there in over 30 countries. So I think uh, export is a really, really essential for anybody to be able to improve the quality. When you look at York, for example, you know, they, they are into their export game somewhat, you know, they're small, but they're not very big in that. But yes. that has helped them in, in improve the quality. Yes, I agree. Uh, I, I, I also agree with that view, Subhash, because uh, while there's no direct correlation in improving quality, when you do place your wines in the overseas markets, particularly the more developed markets, where there is more competition and there's a greater need for us to uh, be able to offer a certain standard. I think, you know, if there are opportunities that come, like we recently had a wine from India, um, 
that got listed at Waitrose. Uh, and now yeah. there are some series of webinars that are about to take place uh, at the 67 Palmal, which is going to showcase again Indian wines and an understanding of the Indian wine industry. And I think when we compete on the global stage, we automatically sort of push ourselves to offer uh, a higher quality or a world class quality as opposed to sometimes maybe if you're offering our offering remains at the local level, we sort of assume that, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it's OK to, you know, like like I've often wondered and I don't know anybody can take this question, but I've often wondered why in India do we not have four or five hundred rupee wine, which is a single variety where we can respectably offer a Chardonnay or a Shiraz or a Sauvignon Blanc or whatever it is. Uh, and why is it generally like a multi blend of all the things that are put together and mostly anonymous um, and um, uh, you know, why is the Indian wine industry unable to offer a simple everyday drinking, but a clean, pure, well-made, sound quality wine at between four to five hundred rupees? Because I think that's something that will help aid the consumption to a higher level, won't it? Uh, and uh, Subhash, I want to know what your comments yeah, are. I, I think before Ravi or Gaurav react to it, I would like to say that that is a number one factor which is responsible, which is going to be responsible for mass consumption of wine. We are talk about wine, which are, okay, we used to get wine for five, four, five, six hundred, uh, but 20 years ago. But today, wines are, good wines are more than a thousand rupees. And people normally cannot afford those wines on an everyday basis. We want people to get into the habit of opening a bottle of wine without, uh, you know, saying, oh my goodness, uh, it's, it's a thousand rupees a bottle. And if I just, finish a half a bottle or one third of a bottle, the rest is going to go waste. That's another problem with wine, of course. So I think the answer will definitely lie. And I have, uh, I, I do appreciate Fratelli has a Classico, which uh, is pretty decent wine, but but they're also, they used to sell for 400 rupees, now it's gone to 550, 600 rupees, something like that. So I think 400 rupees is the key figure where you have to have a nice drinkable wine. It's it's, it's okay if you have a, a blend. I mean, varietal or blend is the same thing. I mean, if you have Chardonnay <clears throat> and you blend it with Sauvignon Blanc, you think it's a better taste, it's okay. But uh, you need to keep that figure for masses. There are people who trade up all over the world. Their wines they sell for two dollars. They sell for two thousand dollars. But the two dollar wines sell a hell of a lot, you know. So right. therefore, our growth will depend on this four hundred rupee wine. You picked the right point where you said that those are the wines we need to have and more of. And where the guy says doesn't have to think anything about it, goes to a store and picks up that wine and enjoys drinking it. Sure. Ravi, Gaurav, any thoughts on how pricing could play a role in, in helping boost consumption of wine in, in the country? Ravi, you want to go ahead first, please? Uh, the pricing, there are two strands of thought that we exploring. One is that in the end, the, the MRP that a consumer faces uh, contains a lot of taxation. So if, ta if taxation changes, then the, the, the price will drop. And uh, wine is more taxed per degree of alcohol than uh, than whiskey. If you compare a whiskey at 40% alcohol, look at the price, of, the amount of tax you pay for every milliliter of pure alcohol that you get in whiskey compared to wine, you'll find a factor of maybe six. The difference is a factor of six. In, wine is not taxed, it's water which is taxed in the wine, which is absurd. The, 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 I think the second uh, thing that you must uh, realize is that wine is not cheap to produce in India. India is a low cost production place for industry. You can produce cheap industrial goods. It's not a low cost producer of wine. Because of the, the, the tropical viticulture that involves more cost than normal viticulture, because we have two growing seasons per year, so we spend twice as much in the fields. Uh, the life expectancy of the vines is lower. La agricultural land is expensive in India. It's expensive even compared to France. So, uh, there are many regions in France where you can buy a vineyard for a lot cheaper than I pay in India. Mm. Uh, in, the, the, because of the need of um, irrigation, because of the climate, the, the capex involved in planting a vineyard in India 
is not cheap by world standards. All, all of these contribute. There's no way we can achieve the bulk pricing that Chile or, or Australia can achieve. Ravi, I well appreciate your point that the cost of production in India for wine is high and also mostly for the reasons that you've just stated, which is the high cost of sort of overcoming challenges, not being able to, uh, you know, do too much use of, um, you know, disease pressure is high. So you have to try and protect the quality and the integrity of the uh, during the wine growing season. Uh, the cost of all imported material, bottling, everything, barrels, everything coming from overseas. Uh, so I fully appreciate that. But in the same token, if I can again play devil's advocate, we do see at the retail level uh, schemes going out of like, you know, uh, maybe I'm getting, getting more technical now and more trade related. Mm -hmm. But the point is that when we offer our retailers buy one, get one free sort of schemes yeah. in the market, I'm not saying you specifically, yeah, no, no, I'm no, just speaking no, no, broadly no, about the Indian wine. Don't, don't feel like targeting yeah. But when the industry offers yeah. a buy one, get one free to the retailer and the retailer sometimes does That's not crazy. end up passing that discount to the consumer, the consumer still ends up bearing the brunt of having to pay higher taxes. The retailer mm -hmm. takes the advantage of a over a 50% discount. I'm saying, why does he need to be given a 50-60% scheme? If he can just be given his 12% and maybe double of that, maybe a 20-25% scheme, but no more than that. And then the rest of the benefit is passed on to the right. consumer by right. way of more rationalized mm -hmm. pricing. Why can't this happen? Uh, Adam Smith can Don't explain Don't hate me for asking this question, but I'm dying to know. No, no, no. Adam Smith can explain to you why that's the invisible end of the market. I and mean, there's a competitive pressure is fierce despite the industry being small and people feel the urge, which I think is misguided, but feel the urge to give discounts. Now, on the more philosophical approach, the whole industry creates value. That value is not today going to farmers or going to wineries or going to consumers. It goes mostly to trade. When you compare the level of schemes in, in wine compared to whiskey, it's a many orders of magnitude difference. So there is value created by the industry. It is not captured by consumers or farmers. There is value in the aviation industry. Historically, it's not been for the shareholder of the aviation industry. It's been for consumers, most travelers. The same thing is happening. We need to figure out a way to get out of that death spiral because we'll all be dead if we continue crazy schemes. We'll all be dead. And it's extremely important in the end that the consumer be able to receive those benefits. And one of the things that the government can do, or the government's state mostly, is allow online sales and deliveries. Because it will immediately change the, the nature of the game and you will see the price paid by the consumer drop substantially. Okay. Got any thoughts on pricing before I move to the next question? No, no, I, I echo Ravi's uh, comments completely. Um, even um, on the, you know, on the on the on the growth side as well. You know, our climate conditions uh, uh, basically uh, enabled the very aggressive growth of of your uh, at your vineyards. As a result, even the life of uh, vineyards will be shorter. Uh, it, that is our belief in India compared to other parts of the world because they're producing all the time. They never get to rest because of the uh, prevalent climatic conditions. Um, and I think uh, what Ravi also said on the retail side, there is value being created. It's just getting lost. Um, uh, lost in the sense it is going in the pockets of someone, just not the consumers or the producers. Yeah, um, but that creates a very unfortunate vicious cycle because what happens is at the end of the day, and, and you know, we talk to customers or every day right in the business they are friends they are customers their clients and so on and i think when it comes to look we're all fully aware that the price of wine is determined by so many factors you know the cost of land the cost of marketing the cost of logistics the cost of material there are so many variants there's also a certain brand value and so on right that that exists globally but at the end of the day all said and done my only point is that whatever liquid is in the glass and whatever is the price of that liquid, there, there has to be an intrinsic relationship, which means that when I take a sip of that wine, I should feel like it tastes what 1200 rupees if I'm paying 1200 rupees for that bottle. If that intrinsic value is not on the taste, 
then I think this it, we're flawed to start with. And I think what happens, uh, and of course, this is not a reflection on any of your wines. I'm just making a very generalized statement. Uh, when the entire industry operates at a at a 900 plus and a thousand, 1200, 1400, and my God, even going as high as 4000, if the intrinsic taste of that wine doesn't offer that value to the consumer on the palate, then there's a dissonance, there's a disconnect. And then, you know, then all these things, I mean, the retailer, does, I mean, the, the consumer doesn't know that the retailer is eating all the margin and not passing it over to him. He just automatically looks to the wine company and says, these guys are just making, you know, wines that I don't enjoy. So I think the reputational risk ultimately lies with the, the wine production company. And I think wine producing companies need to, according to me, take a closer look at how their pricing is translating down to the consumer and take charge of that. Because if that benefit is not going to the consumer by way of the schemes, then maybe it's time to relook at those, those sort of, uh, you know, the, the whole supply chain and how the price of wine gets altered in that entire supply chain uh, process. Uh, Subhash, any thoughts on this? Absolutely. You know, uh, uh, when I got your message and I started jotting down a few points and within 10 minutes, I think I had about 35 points. My first point right on top was stop giving schemes like today. I think this has been the bane of the wine industry and the producers no, no fault of theirs because they're all in a rut right now. I remember the time when, when you calculated, you're talking of 15% discount, so to speak, you know, or 20%. Then it went to 25%. And then today, 50% is, is nothing. People are talking of 60% discounts. I've got a scheme with me of these producers who are giving one more than the other. And you're right. And sometimes even the damn laws do not allow the the retailer to discount the wine bombay of course you still can do to some extent and there are people who pass on some but you rightly said that the discount is not passed on and the producers are not making money out of it and they are in the big circle i think they are stuck in the like bit, between the mafia i call the retail people as mafias today to be honest and thank they, you Subhash. thank yeah. you for sharing that just to switch gears a little bit uh subhash what role can people like you and me and media and influencers and educators and writers play to, to help the industry grow? What do you feel we can do? Well, I think the one thing that will kind of counter this, and that has to be through the government, and that is, number one is the online sales. They have to allow the online sales. And they have to allow the wine industry, the producers, to be able to sell directly at the price that they like to sell maybe at the winery, maybe at a depot, maybe one place in town where people can go and buy and where they can give those discounts and bring the prices down because producers need to have the margins and they're not getting the margins. You know, uh, um, you talk of Sula Grover Fratelli all the time, but I don't know Grover, how much money Grover is making off Fratelli. Sula is making some money over the last 20 years they've been working at it. But the thing is that we have to have, and so we have to keep on pushing the government to allow the online sales, home deliveries, and stuff like that, which makes the producer the more accessible to the consumer. So with the retailers also come to the senses because today they think that, okay, you know, this is to me, it's a commodity. I, you give me 50% and I'll sell, otherwise I don't sell. The quality or not quality, I don't care. So you need to sort of work on that. As an and and for, uh, for Ravi and for Gaurav, uh, do you feel any lack of concern about, uh, do you feel a concern about the fact that India lacks any kind of rules or regulations that govern production, labeling integrity? Uh, and, you know, we talk about quality, but quality is not regulated in our country. So can IPA play a role there? So IPA, for the benefit of our viewers, is, is uh, All India Wine Producers Association. It has existed now for a few years, but it's had its moments of being more active and less active over the past years. And I know that more recently there have been some, there's been some movement and some, some efforts to sort of really have IPA come into the fore and, and do more, uh, you know, take charge of the front seat. So Ravi, how do you feel... Uh, what, what, firstly, what can IPA do for us? What should it be doing rather? And how do you think we can, as an industry, benefit uh, from that? Well, it's, it's not completely fair to say that we are in a sort of unregulated environment. We, we are not. Uh, there are many uh, 
restrictions and controls on what we can and cannot do because it's it's, it's a food item. Uh, there are many restrictions because of excise on what can and cannot be done because it's an alcoholic beverage. And we remember that we are also uh, exporting, I mean, most of the big producers in India export around the world. So they are effectively subject to the regulation of those countries. In order to send our wines in the EU and Japan, we need to meet tough criteria. So that environment exists. It's not really as codified in India as it is elsewhere. It will come. The industry is still young. It will come. Uh, it's actually helpful for us to have more regulation, more label rules, more uh, terroir rules. But it's also a barrier to the uh, to entry for the new world entrance. I'm in favor of it. I, I understand, I understand Sir Jacob, about the fact that yes, we we automatically get regulated when we export our wines mm -hmm. and we, we are subject to it because our excise and our FSSAI and all these other bodies are very very particular about you know um, certain declarations on where on labels of sulfites and alcohol levels yeah. and, and additives and so on. But still, you know, there is a lot of um, uh, unanswered or unaddressed areas in terms of uh, d proper disclosure of grape varieties, for example, like label integrity, for example, or appellations uh, don't exist for us yet. Um, quality, yields, uh, plantations, density of plants, you know, all of that. So all of these which are intrinsically linked to quality are still areas that need to be sort of addressed. Do you feel um, some of this also could could, I mean, I know it's not going to directly lead to making us a 5,000 crore industry, but the point being, uh, what role can IPA play? And not just with regulatory, but more at a promotion level. How do you see, like, if you were the president of IPA, what would you expect the IPA to do? I think the notion of terroir, which is accepted in India from a regulatory point of view, and also from a consumer point of view, would be hugely beneficial. That's one way of increasing the value what is what is being produced and incentivizing farmers to produce more where it matters. Oh, it's worth it. Today, uh, there are crazy regulations saying in Maharashtra you cannot transport uh, wine between wineries. That's a very complicated thing. So, and you cannot transport between states. That's huge uh, excise impact. So we plant some varietals in Maharashtra, some in Karnataka, and maybe the best terroir is only in Maharashtra, and maybe the best terroir is only in Karnataka. We are not, we are prevented from planting the best grapes in the best terroir today. There's all sorts of rules. Getting away those rules will definitely help the industry go, will get the industry in a better shape, will help, will help farmers, because it will be easier for them to get a better valuation for the land that they have. So uh, all of this should is something that should happen. Yeah. Uh, and we'll push for it as much as possible. Great, great. Now, Laura, the drawback, it's, uh, it prevents, uh, it's, it's a kind of administrative barrier to, to competition. But there's maybe the price to pay to grow at this stage. Amazing. Well, thank you for that. Gaurav, I want to touch upon a quick marketing question for you. Um, I want to ask you about, because Fratelli is very active, you know, I know it has a social media page, you have a lot of followers, uh, there's a lot you do in terms of trying to make wine appear young uh, and, and more contemporary, more fun. Um, so the communication of wine uh, obviously needs to be adapted. But my point is, what are your thoughts about bringing new consumers to wine and what is it that you feel the consumer is looking for and who are the consumers of wine the way you see them in India today? Before I answer that, I'll, I'll just give you three points, which I think, you know, the uh, organization, the association, or even, um, you know, yourself and uh, Mr. Aurora can, can help address. You know, we have some very low hanging fruits, um, which one can aim for. I think um, this uh, uh, issue of great movement interstate, I mean, it's just silly uh, for it to be not allowed. I right? agree. Uh, yeah. Farmers are suffering because of that. Um, they are playing in the hands of touts and intermediaries uh, because eventually market will find a way to 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 service its need. Uh, but the farmers are suffering. Um, you know, our embassies, many of them, 
do not serve indian wine you know we are screaming about vocal for local and things like that but if you go to an indian embassy abroad invariably they will not have indian wine now that just sets us terrible uh, example it almost it's like screaming out to say that you know we are incapable of making good wine now that's a very simple tweak uh, a simple diktat which can fix it um it's a poor reflection of uh, of of our policy um so that's another issue i think there are some institutions hotels restaurants in india which are a bit biased against indian wine some of it you can say as subhash ji rightly said uh, you know our early wine making uh, you know uh, efforts were probably not great and they developed a bit of a bias against indian wine but that's not the case anymore you know we do make good wines but still there are some institutions which have this thing that we will not list indian wines i think some of this needs to go away and I, and i want to just credit taj hotels who is actually going the opposite way which is saying that no we're going to list everything that is indian uh, we're going to give it preference and this That's sector is a brilliant that. point you've raised garo you remind me of my holiday i took 2 years ago and i went to croatia and croatia is on the world wine you know map of wine making but it's not there you know it's like it's not kind of it's not the first point of reference for wine making when you think of croatia uh and i stayed there for a week and i we ate out and and there was croatian wines 70% croatian wines listed across all their restaurants and croatia gets an awful lot of tourism i mean they're just flooded with tourists and 70% of their wine lists were dominated by croatian wines were all of them amazing no of course not but did we try a croatian wine every evening every single evening absolutely i tried so many croatian wines and ended up drinking more croatian wines i love your point about the fact that the embassy the government bodies the restaurants the bars the the airlines um, and every service industry uh, needs to embrace a not just one or two labels but a very large percentage of indian wine brands because if we don't do it who will like if it's, uh, it's so not, uh, yeah. my my limited point is that we do not want to deny consumers uh, the opportunity to choose even yeah. imported wines that that yes. would be unfair as well yes. to the consumers but at the same time the right kind of uh, atmosphere has to be created for indian wines to be sampled and tried by people um and and that's the limited point i'm making and and some of these things are not that complicated to fix um so that was my point and i can get to answering your question about marketing but i think um, I, maybe mr subhash arora has has something to say subhash yeah Uh, okay so i think this is a great point uh, i i have been uh, um, talking to the various ministries for a number of years now and uh, i i do remember sir mr matthew that was name in was foreign secretary uh, uh, but f- f- uh, 10 years ago and he did tell me that uh, they have informed all the embassies abroad to serve indian wines now you know th- and i told him i said you know your em- embassies and your government they all expect free wine which is not fair because the producer has to survive you know you have to give him okay get good prices but you know when white house buys their wines from california they pay for the wine when the queen buys wine from england to the market they pay for the wines so even in india you think that okay i'll serve your wine and because i do i do know that embassies contacts these producers and I'm, it happens many times when it's okay we will serve your wine but please sell us send us four cases of free wine and out of three cases probably is is drinking in his own house so that is not the way to do things but yes we need to and i really appreciate god's uh, point over there and the other fact which which i on i'm on record to have said 12 years ago that indian uh state functions banquets we must start thinking of serving indian wines only indian wines like they do in in the us and i also said that will take 100 years b- before that happens but we have to make the efforts uh, 12 years has happened that, i mean i'm still saying that and i think 88 years maybe your grandchildren can push that idea and hopefully we'll have one day but i think those are the things because that we need to give respect to the indian wine which has not been happening and by doing these things you do get the respect and of course more visibility and people who who sort of uh, read about it or who uh, drink these wines or hear about these wines they'll drink more you know so that helps increase the production the consumption amazing amazing i'm going to um, 
ask one question for all three of you to answer and it's a very easy and a broad sort of a question and allows you to give me any creative answer that you like but the question is this if you were made the ceo of the indian wine industry like overall in charge not just of fratelli or grover vineyards or anything else just overall in charge of the entire wine industry what three changes would you make at the policy or the business level to become a 5000 crore industry it could even just be a decision that you make you know it doesn't necessarily have to be a change of policy but what three things would you like to see implemented at a national level um and you could even talk about imported wines if you like but you know what what sort of decisions would you like to or changes you would like to see come through to make this immediately a 5000 crore industry in the next 5 years uh let me I'm happy for anybody to take this question let me answer that uh first of all i think the the question you sh- said about ceo that will not really help what you need to do what do you need to say is what if you were the prime minister of the country yes agreed because, because our problem is in the constitution and if i were the prime minister like mr modi is all the power he's got i would amend the, se- the section uh 47 uh, in, in the in the constitution and say that wine is not a part of the alcohol the key problem in india and it's problem in many other countries in the world also by the way that we are lumping wine with alcohol we are lumping wine with alcohol with the um, liquor uh, whiskey and gin and all that which are different ball game all together so we have to we have to sort of uh, have different po- policies for wine and so therefore you know i i would say that that's very essential and the other thing you know like this uh, I, i mean i was just thinking uh, uh, giving a, a sort of a, a thought to the whole thing and amusing myself and i said a seminar like this you need to have three of us is fine but we needed to have the minister of finance health agriculture and food processing industries also because these are the people who need to be educated what we know what we are we are here because of our passion whether it's you or ravi or gaurav or, 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 or rajiv samant they are all doing it for passion money of course is essential but uh, you're doing it with passion so therefore it is very essential for the government to understand and appreciate that wine is something different and it has to be uh, taken care of separately and then let the industry grow Uh, uh in that style great thank you uh ravi gaurav any thoughts uh, i i would say three things i would do as a prime minister and i cannot be prime minister of india so that's easy for me to say i thought i thought i was going a bit realistic with ceo of indian wine <laughs> but no so bash wants to catch the bull by its horn well no i think the three things are not in that order necessarily of importance are probably yeah. for me Uh, GST online sales and uh, revamping agricultural land rules which make it very very difficult to grow this industry totally agree with that love yeah. it love it i love the first two points uh what was the third again ravi agricultural land is a big problem in india and wow. to grow this industry we need to do lots of reforms in the way it's handled in the way its ownership is allowed structured in the way it's uh, we can pledge or not agricultural land to raise money from banks there are all kinds of constraints nice. which make it extremely difficult to grow the industry yes it's a nightmare and you would know this because you're you're yeah. developing tourism yes, I mean, so, 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 we didn't have enough time to like, talk about tourism but tourism is such a big can be such a huge revenue generator for the industry i must admit i was a bit disappointed and, and I you, any example. reference made yeah. to tourism in the entire budget that just happened right there was no acknowledgement whatsoever uh, i was really hoping well, corner of we don't expect to reach for the next year <laughs> we don't expect no, to reach really for the next year <laughs> you know eno tourism would be sort of yeah. at least be mentioned or something would come through for us uh, yeah. in the last budget but uh, there wasn't even a whiff i thought particularly because tourism is seems to be it's the right time right we're not going to be traveling overseas uh at the drop of a hat so everybody is going to be traveling within india and i really felt that indian tourism or or you know could have been given a bit more boost you know and as you rightly said just the whole thing about from buying land to developing it and starting something it could be such a nightmare in this country you know in terms of uh, 
getting all the necessary permission. I mean, so if so the tea industry, which has a lot of exemption under Indian rules and constitution, and right. to face the same rules as we do, there would be no tea industry in India. Correct. Exactly. Uh, and also, I think so Maharashtra is doing something in tourism industry more than anybody else. They are, uh, you know, because I think your mm. AIWP also, they are more linked with Maharashtra government. And so they are trying to, in fact, I believe the finance secretary was invited to visit the vineyards and taste the wine just uh, as a consumer and things like that. So they are a little bit more uh, attuned to what's going on. But I think uh, you're right. Uh, I, I, it's not I, being done at the level that, that you know, because we, we have such a massive population of, of yeah, yeah. aspirational middle class and upwards, all the way upwards, who are just dying to spend their money and get out and looking to spend on experiences. And yeah. wine is so unique in terms of offering that experiences. Yeah. It's yeah. not unheard of to know of wineries uh, who make 40% of their total revenue just out of tourism. So it can be well, such a big bumper, you know, to helping. If you look uh, at the Napa Valley, the yeah. smaller wineries at the Napa Valley sell close to 100% of their there production to, um, to wine tourists. And Napa overall, it, you know, it, it contributes in billions to the economy. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, and we, we have that population base which can yeah. uh, do that for the government, you know. So, so Sony, may I have a crack at please, your question? Please, I was absolutely uh, coming at you. So, so, so the three points, um, you know, that I would recommend is one, I would like for the government to work towards removing the taboo surrounding alcohol consumption. Um, case in point wine, if wine is decoupled from Alcobev, I mean, that's very selfish of us to say, but overall, personally, if I was given the opportunity, I would change the whole perception about alcohol as a taboo. Even today in our country, it's kind of looked down upon. You see the permit yes. rooms, they're dark and dingy for yeah. a reason. People don't want to be seen in them. Um, uh, you know, wine shops, a lot of them, especially government owned, are not nice to visit. Um, I think especially women feel unsafe going and purchasing wine. So if your question is targeted, what do we need to do to get to 5,000 crore with it by 2026? I think an active campaign to disassociate, uh, you know, that whole negativity around alcohol consumption, something like that should be done. Yeah. Um, online sales. I think these two alone will see you through to 5,000 crore. You, you don't need to do anything else. Correct. Correct. I'm sorry, Gaurav, uh, I, I, might, I must point out that when you talk of uh, uh, alcohol overall, alcohol is a big problem internationally. Globally, it's a problem in every country. And the amount of deaths we have with people who are drunk and killing people. So that sort of thing is never going to happen here. And uh, people do get uh, uh, really overly drunk with, with the hard alcohol. And uh, I think wine is something which handled carefully, moderately, it's possible and people are doing it in general, you know. I have, we have I've done a, a sort of very interesting study. We have a wine club dinner, Delhi Wine Club, okay. And uh, we consume 0.8 bottles of wine in a dinner and sometimes 0.9 and even one bottle, okay. And I keep track of every dinner after dinner in the last 18 years, not a single incident has happened, you know, in the sense that no, no accident, no speeding, no problem of any kind. Now, I cannot say the same thing uh, with a person drinking, having a session of whiskey, having six glasses of whiskey or seven glasses and going home. So, and Raju, my, my, uh, sorry, my, my point is not about, um, you know, any of those things that you mentioned. Yeah, it's, just, not, it's not as much behavior. Global, yeah. Globally, those are, those are things that you simply don't do. You don't drink and drive, you know. But in India, we actively consider white, uh, you know, any kind of alcohol, including wine, as a taboo. My issue is, is that um, the way we position our policies, we promote prohibition actively in election campaigns, Right. So, so we are saying that, you know, the better way of living is, is without alcohol. Andhra Pradesh came so close to going yeah. into prohibition. So did Kerala, right? Yes. Uh, we've already got two states uh, like that. So my limited point, my limited point here is just don't pitch it as a, as a negative thing. Don't say it's positive and certainly don't advocate drink and drive. Um, that's, that's not the 
course, the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just saying, just don't consider it to be a bad thing. Um, you know, uh, so that is one. And online sales, and I think some rationalization of state, uh, where you know, just taxation across states, GST is a solution. What yeah. Ravi just said. Alternatively, um, just follow the example of some states which have you know very good, decent policy on taxation versus some states which have terrible way of ta uh, taxation on wine. So this fix even those states. And it's fine. And you get to your 5,000 crores, even by 2024, by 26. That's amazing. On that note, I'm going to uh, just quickly summarize because this has been such an exciting conversation. And I'm glad I really asked that last question because it kind of helps us, uh, you know, completely encapsulate all our points. And I think we all seem to agree on the points. What we really want is for wine to become a national product where there is a free movement of wine as a product across states and there aren't penalties uh, and one shouldn't have to buy a winery in an adjacent state just to be able to sell that wine in that state that's that's terrible uh, you know to have to do so we want wine to be a national product we definitely want the government to encourage online sales of wines because that can be a huge huge bump to the industry and in any case india actually has 20 percent of the gen z population in the world which is completely digitally savvy and they're digital natives they are they, you know they're not learning uh, how to go about digitization halfway through their lifespan they were born with with a with a laptop or a, or an apple phone in their hands so basically they're natives and they to them, it comes really easily. Tourism needs to be given a huge boost because it can be a massive, not just a revenue, uh, you know, employment, rural employment, but also a huge revenue earner to the exchequer. Um, we are talking about um, the. F I love your point, Gaurav, about India needs to have a more positive, favorable, and a healthy relationship with wine, not the current convoluted relationship or the strained or the dico dichotomy, as you call it, you know, the dichotomous relationship that we have with wine where we want the revenue, but we don't want to admit it. And, you know, we sort of can't decide where, which side of the fence we sit on. So we really need to build that favorable, positive relationship. And, uh, yeah, just overall, if some of these things are taken, and I would just dare add to that, the fact that as a business, if we are then able to rationalize some of our pricing, offer a high quality product that is consistent vintage after vintage, has some ability to age or keep because one of the sore points also for a lot of consumers is wine is different at the winery and then it's different and fully compromised when it's at the retail level. So somewhere that quality needs to also be kept. Uh, the integrity of that quality also somehow needs to be built in, factored in and maintained throughout its lifespan, whatever that lifespan may be, whether it's one year or it's 20 years, you know, what, depending on the quality level of that wine. Uh, but some of these things and, and rationalization of pricing, if all of these things are taken care of, I really, really don't see why we can't be a 5,000 crore industry over the next five years. And inshallah, Gaurav, in your words, even in shorter period than that. So I'm going to, I don't have a glass of wine with me, but I'm going to raise an imaginary glass to that thought. On that note, I'm going to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for being part of this this amazingly engaging discussion, being frank. And on my final note, all I really want to know is, Subhash, I want to know where you're getting the 60% scheme from because that is my big <laughs> takeaway. That's what I want. <laughs> so anyway, just trying to add some humor at the end. But uh, thank you all. Thank you so much. All right. for being thank you for organizing this. Thank really you for having us. Really yeah. Bye, Subhashji. Bye, Ravi. Bye. Bye. See you all Bye. soon. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, Solo. Bye.
For the part-time bonsai artist, who's a full-time investment banker, here's a piece of art that happens to be a decanter. Introducing the hosting collection by Shaze. Shine by design.
Welcome back, friends. After that very enthralling session on how to grow the Indian wine industry to 5,000 crores by the, by, the next, by the next five years, which is by 2026, we're back on to another very, very engaging session. And I have a very special guest who's going to join us. It's none other than Mr. Ian Harris, who is the chief executive officer at the WSCT. WSCT needs no introduction. As you all know, they are the undisputed global leaders in providing education and qualifications in wine, spirits, and sakes to professionals and enthusiasts across over 70 countries, pretty much all around the world. In his time at the HEM, Ian has overseen the transformation, the true transformation of WSCT into one of the largest global organizations of its kind. Ian was named the Drinks Businessman of the Year in 2015 and has been honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Drinks Retailing Awards in 2016. More recently, in 2018, Ian Harris was appointed a member of the Order of the British Empire, which is the highest recognition bestowed by the Queen of England herself to people who've made invaluable contributions to an industry that they represent. In, in Ian's case, of course, that's the wine and spirits industry. We are honored that Ian could be our special guest joining us on today's session at the Knowledge Summit by Sonal Holland Wine Academy. And I'm just so delighted because I know Ian has had to move around a few meetings to be able to accommodate this session. So Ian, I'm delighted and thank you so much very much it's, it's my pleasure I, i'm i'm sorry we can't we can't meet in person i have got such wonderful memories of when when i came to india a couple of years ago and uh, we had such a great such a great time so we're now in the virtual world but i'm delighted you to were, be we were we were so we were so honored two years ago when you actually flew over from london all the way to be part of india wine awards in 2019 <laughs> And gosh, that seems so far back in time. You know, 2020 has just been a bit of a blur, hasn't it, for all of us. But uh, I'm, I'm so grateful that you're here today. And today we will be discussing uh, uh, and having an enthralling discussion on the growing importance of wine and beverage education in India, how to build a career in the wine industry, and how good education can actually help shape careers for professionals in the country. I'm one such example, but of course, we're going to, uh, you know, after my chat with you, we're going to have two other people join on this discussion to take us through their own life journeys and how they decided and how WCT education has helped them. So to deep dive straight into our discussion, Ian, my first question to you would be, uh, WCT has had such an amazing enviable history of where it was and what it's become today, this formidable leader in the world in, in wine spirits and sake education. Tell us a little bit about this journey, how it came to be recognized as such a globally recognized educational body of tremendous credibility. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Good question. Um, um, yeah. I mean, we've been around for 50 years, but um, until I, I joined 19 years ago now, uh, when I joined, it was still very much a UK centric organization, but I worked in a, I worked in a multinational spirits company called Seagram. And I, I realized the importance of, of, of having lots of eggs in lots of baskets and the internationalization of, of WSET to be, to be, to me, it was a it was a completely natural thing to do when I first joined, and it was certainly one of my goals. And what we did, we um, we set about uh, finding the markets where we knew that education in in wines and in spirits in those days we didn't have sake in those earlier days, but in the, the, I'm talking about 2002 when I joined, and and we we set about looking at, uh, at markets where education in wines and spirits was going to be a key driver of not just the industry, but, but people's opportunities for careers within that industry. So we, we'd all, we'd all, when I joined, we already had um, providers in countries like America, Hong Kong, a couple in Singapore, Japan, f even France. So the British yeah. people keep teaching the French about, um, about wines. And 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 it basically grew from there. And the reputation of of WSCT's qualifications grew on a worldwide basis. And more and more countries started to realise that if they needed to educate people who worked in the either the hospitality sector or yes. the wine and spirit sector, that they needed a global qualification because we live in a we live in a world where people aren't necessarily going to be staying in the same place. And they need they needed a global uh, qualification. So we 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 
we were there at the right time to be honest as the, as the world opened up and um as you said quite rightly 70 countries um and and to have india as one of those and it's you know it's a pretty prominent country now it's, ama it's amazing how it's grown so the globalization happened really because it was one of my stated goals when i joined the wsct um and we've we've our business has grown as a result of of all the exponential growth that we've had in pretty pretty much all of those 70 countries that we currently operate in. That's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed and I have so much admiration for, you know, I mean, to scale up to, to be represented in across 70 countries is one thing, but to be able to sort of have it down to this great level of discipline and processes and policies in place and a certain level of quality that gets maintained um, throughout all the countries where your courses are offered is another ball game, isn't it? I mean, that must have been a huge, huge, uh, I, one can see that there's such a massive machinery at play at the background that sort of ensures that that takes place. I, I can't help but think back in 2009 when I uh, just had flown back having done my WSET level three actually at the time. Um, and I was I just about to embark on the level uh, four, the diploma. I thought I should become an approved program provider of WSET. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know, for some reason, I thought I had, I had this brainwave of an idea that nobody else in this, in, in this world had had, only to realize later that you were already across so many countries. But when I thought of it, I thought, oh God, I'm being such a genius. Why don't I just start offering WSET courses? And I did that because I realized that not everybody would, uh, you know, would have the, the the time and the resources to be able to fly over to London like I had done and take those courses. And I thought if this industry was to grow to a certain size, we would uh, we would need to have a world class educational uh, academy here in place that could offer the WSED courses and provide an experience for an individual like pretty much like he was literally just sitting in London and, and doing the course, you know, with the wines yeah. and the level of teaching and so on and so forth. But even after 12 years of having done this, and of course we've seen a massive amount of growth, but um, it's still no way I feel comparable to some of the success you've achieved in some of the other markets. So my question, uh, Ian, is give us an example of a fabulous case study of some other market, maybe even China or wherever else you feel, where we just seen an exponential growth of WSET education and how it's been sort of really center stage to, to shaping the industry of wine, spirits and alcohol in that country. Okay, I mean, good, again, a good question. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll probably give two two um, answers to that question. Actually, I mean, we know about the size of China, so it's a it was a it was somewhere that we um, we, we had already targeted as a big as a big growth option. But actually, the two the two examples I'll give firstly is the USA, um, because the USA was very much a mature market in terms of their knowledge of wines and fabulous restaurants great hotels and wine already had a very big place in the in the in, in the u.s uh, way of way of life as indeed spirits as well so and, and the the case study there really is that we got we got into the the, the middle tier of distribution which is the distributor network because in, in america everything has to go through distributors so you have produce it's the three-tier system producers go through distributors and the products end up in restaurants or stores. So that was a, that was one way, one one very successful case study. Yeah. In the, US, the USA is now our number one market. But the other one, actually, I'm going to I'm going to point to India because you know India was very much a, a I describe it as a fledgling, particularly wine market. You know, you you Sonal, you've led the way, give you know, given your your um, your master of wine qualification you know well, well done uh, but india has been a fa fantastic case study for us because we 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 first uh, started doing running courses in india uh, 2007 um and as you said son you, you started in 2009 uh, and we we do have we we have a small number of providers in india so we've, we've got six providers but we're we're starting to get good coverage um and 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 it's not so. It's not just Mumbai. It's uh, it's also um, Bangalore. It's, it's Delhi. Um, and 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 the key for us really is to get is to get influence. So people like yourself, MWs, but also trendsetters, uh, but but also getting into 
hospitality schools, um, bar schools and liquor stores. And we do appreciate that it's 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 far more difficult in a country like India than it is in a, in the in in the United States. In the United States, there's already huge infrastructure. In India, not quite so much. And of course, we're we're obviously very aware of what's happened during the pandemic in India. And certainly when we watch the news at the beginning of of COVID. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, it, it, things were pretty pretty terrible in India. So with so it's remarkable that we've we've actually got uh that the business in, in India is actually holding up pretty well. And it has and it, it does have huge potential because uh it's it's a fledgling wine market, but we've seen how the how the wine uh consumption has grown in india so it's a it's a it's a fantastic opportunity for us so so yeah two case studies one the the, the big usa which big, is the big giant out. usa yeah. the big giant yeah and the other is, is, is india which is just one example of of countries where where we have started delivering wscg qualifications over the last 10 or 15 so there's been a lot of talk in, in India more recently because now, you know, the post-pandemic is almost like a, a new beginning for, for, for a lot of us, you know, mindset-wise as well. We're all sort of thinking, okay, let's start over. Let's start on a clean chapter. Also, a lot of the businesses evolved now. You know, we clearly now cannot... Um, cannot ignore the digitization and the importance of digitization for our businesses and so on. Yeah. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk within India about how we can make this wine industry in India be five times its size that it is over the next five years. We just finished an, a, a very enriching panel discussion with some of the Indian leading wine in, uh, wine producers of India and some critics and writers on talking about this. But my question to you is, in your opinion, what role does education play in helping this industry propel mm -hmm. to the heights that we are envisioning. Uh, how do you see, because I think, you know, I think it's important to make this pitch because I think the industry sometimes fails to understand this. They, they don't understand the importance of training, education. And I know that everything that you do has been backed by a lot of research and stats. And uh, yeah. I mean, you know how it plays out. So do share with us your, your learnings of how this could help shape or propel the growth of our industry? Yeah. Uh, well, I've spent 19 years saying to everybody that education is the key to driving the growth of, of a wine market and wine sale. Uh, and I say to companies, don't think of training and education as, as, as something that you can just cut if, if times are hard. Because training and education actually adds money to the bottom line for any wine company. But also, uh, if you're trying to grow the market to the extent that you, you've just mentioned, and I think it's perfectly achievable, education plays such a big part in it because the education that we provide tumbles right down to the consumer. So it's, it's so we have consumers who do our courses, but but the when when we're doing education for people who are working in particularly the hospitality sector they have through their education the ability to convince people who are coming into their restaurants or bars or hotels to spend a bit more on wine to try a different wine maybe to have wine when when before they might not have even considered having wine with their with with um, with their their food yes. or with their meal so so it it it's education just adds value to the to the industry because people who are educated can persuade the consumers who are going to who are going to be so important to drive the market to try new wines to spend a bit more money and and to yes. embrace wine as part of part of their daily yes. lives Yes. And, you know, I'm a big believer of the fact, Ian, that no amount of education ever goes to waste. Oh, so no, no, no. I, you know, having studied for 10 years back to back in wines, I just think that it's now such an intrinsic part of my personality. You know, it's it's so me, it's so within me uh, mm -hmm. that it automatically translates to um, everything I say, everything I do. It's helped me create. It's helped me pioneer. It's helped me. Um, it's given me the confidence I need to speak in a certain way with authority or with assertion. And sorry, I'm just sort of harping about myself. But the point I'm making really is that you know, it's at, it happens at an individual level, but when there are thousands and thousands of such individuals that come together to, to partake in this education, um, then it creates an industry because it's created a culture, isn't it? Like 
yes. all of us together then make a culture and then therefore we we sort of become part of an industry that takes a certain shape so um there's always you know i get that uh, either organizations and less so now because i think when we started out 10 years ago we had a lot of organizations who didn't see the value of education or trainings uh and how it could add to their bottom lines today less so uh but uh, i would still say and maybe this is a bit of a micro question but and i'm sure you witness this in other countries as well but there's always it's a fair share of naysayers in every country right people who oh, yeah. would look to a wsct or or an organization like wsct not targeting wsct specifically but to say that oh here's a global organization what do they know about what india needs locally uh, let me provide something that is very local centric keeping in mind you know the indianness of the the course design and so on um i of course have my my retort and my answer to that but i'd love to hear yours ian how do you deal with or combat or what do you say or maybe not even say against such naysayers well i think yeah and there's there there are there's lots of naysayers i mean i'm old, i'm old enough to remember in the uk i mean i joined the trade in the uk in the 19, 1977 which is before i'm sure most people on this on this in this call up were, were born and and I joined it at a time when wine in the UK was very much the domain of the people who had lots of money who came from a rich family um I personally my family never drank wine as as a, as a, in their day to day lives so I just fell in love with wine and that's why I joined it but that but there were a lot of people who said um that 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 wine is never going to take off in the UK and of course it, of, of course it did and and there were just as many people who said you know why why do you need education in it? um people don't need to learn about motor cars when they go and buy a buy a buy their next next car and and but wine is a incredibly complicated subject we all know that uh incredibly complicated and 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 you made the point about you know we are a global organization we just happen to be based in london that's where our head office is but we ha- we now have subsidiary businesses around the world and as you know we've got providers in different countries but the key the key for us is that it's it is a global qualification but of course the teaching and you're involved in teaching some of it the teaching can put a subtle nuance onto the into the course to make sure that it is that it is although there's a global syllabus for the courses that the teaching leans towards the different priorities in different countries whether that's india or pa- paraguay or you know one of the newest countries that we've opened in ghana in africa you know you, that's a comp- they, they need a completely different approach so we do rely on the educators to put us put a put put the correct focus to make sure it's relevant to the but we I think we're now getting with the, you know the naysayers i think i think they're all realizing that actually education is pretty good You know, and we um, you know we know in in lots of facets of life education plays such sure. a, a key part in people's future sure i think personally for me i've i've really benefited from the fact that when i've learned from wsct the learning has just been so structured um yeah. i think if i'd gone about it in some local way or at my own pace or in my own way uh i might have done it very randomly and so it wouldn't have looks like a, a a string or a bead of pearls you know very well sort of strung together yeah. uh, it would have just looked a bit haphazard you know or accumulation of knowledge would have been a bit a haphazard i think when you go with somebody um uh, who's virtually perfected it through a more templatized version there is a a structured built up of knowledge course and level after level uh that really then allows you to learn uh the right thing at the right time in the right way just when your mind is ready for it you know because you've already yeah. learned the 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 foundation below that and that's rock solid and then it just kind of gives you that extra level of information which i think sometimes if you if one tries to design something uh or and and i love your point in about the fact that um education is only as good as the educator themselves isn't it the the, the, the syllabus could be globally designed but the dissemination of that knowledge can always be adapted 
by the educator, depending on which country, the yeah. knowledge level or the understanding of the students in the classroom, how much or how less you need to deliberate on a certain point, what do you need to pay more attention to and vice versa. So I think all of these things is what makes for a more powerful combination. You know, the localized understanding of the pulse that the educator has of the market and its students and the the strength of the global curriculum um, that one can draw from to teach is what makes for a very powerful combination. And I personally, as a professional, benefited immensely from all the learning that I have done at WCT, one level after another, all the way up to the flagship diploma, which I passed in 2010. Um, and, and, and a little knowledge goes a long way. And, you know, you've, you've gone right up through all the levels and even beyond WSET, obviously, to, to master of wine. But, but even at level one, which is a one-day course, you learn enough to be able to influence someone who's in who's, who, who walks through your, the door of your restaurant or your bar or your hotel. So a little knowledge goes a very long way. And we, obviously, we, we, we want people to go up the, up, up the ladder in terms of... You know, I have to say this, Ian, and I might sound a bit trivial saying this, but I really love the level one course in wine <laughs> it's good isn't it <laughs> i find myself going back to it every time and you know what the beauty of that course is every time we teach it we learn something new i don't know how because it's still very foundation but yeah. every time we go back to it because it's you know going back to basics never goes out of fashion somehow you know it's yes. all about the basics in the end so i find that course the most interesting and uh, uh, yeah i've just had lots of, and the beauty again of every course that i've done from the wscds i remember i remember doing the level one i finished i managed 100 out of 100 and i already started feeling like a master of wine at the end of that one <laughs> i thought i know everything i need to know about wines and i kept thinking oh i wonder what they're going to teach me at level two because i mean this seems comprehensive enough <laughs> and funny enough i went through that feeling at every stage after level two i felt oh my god that was like a lot like i've gone really as deep as i could possibly go there couldn't possibly be any more then came level three and that was the major jump and i thought oh my god this is this is like phd now like i'm i'm full you know uh, neck deep in in knowledge and, and then came the diploma which was another story and the rest is history yeah. but the point being um every level that you go through it just makes you that much more competent confident and makes you feel like Oh my God! I think I know everything I need to know to go out there and make a difference. So it's yeah, not I mean, about. You use the, sorry, you, you yeah. use the word confidence. That's absolutely what it's about. It's having the confidence to be able to talk to somebody, just a, with a little bit of knowledge, but the confidence to be able to talk about a subject which, 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 which is it's complicated and. It's that's exactly it. And the different levels give you more confidence, more confidence and even more confidence. That's what it's about. For and it's and you know, one thing is, uh, I mean, I love the word confidence because you can't fake it. That's right. the other thing. You can't fake confidence. You either have it or you don't have it. And a lot of that confidence can come from solid learning. Yeah. You know, and like I had said, even at the India Wine Awards uh, uh, speech, that uh, knowledge, uh, investment in knowledge is the one that pays the highest rate of interest. Absolutely. Uh, it never really goes out of fashion, right? So, yeah. so okay. that's great. Okay, Ian, I want to jump into a little bit of marketing. I know you come with a marketing <laughs> yeah. background and yeah. my little interaction I've had with you on the in the car on the way to Sula Vineyards, <laughs> I know that you're a true blue marketer at heart. So... Um, Tell us more about the importance of, uh, you know, your personal journey, firstly, and how do you sort of find yourself using, uh, you know, your, your marketing understanding and the core or the instinct to make WSCD what it is and, you know, uh, more exciting as an organization? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was before I joined WSCD, I was, I was um, marketing director of Seagram UK, but I was also... Prior to that, I was global marketing manager for Martel Cognac, which is a which is a product which I'm sure uh, you and the people on this call will know. But I, I sort of tumbled into marketing almost by accident, actually, because when I um, when Seagram bought Martel Cognac as a, as a as a brand and as a company, they needed somebody who uh, had a bit of marketing experience, which I already had, um, who had some sales experience, which I already had. But the, the reason I got the job was because I could speak French. I was a fluent French speaker, and I was having to deal with 
with the production team in in France. So I sort of tumbled into it by accident. But then my marketing career grew from brand manager, marketing manager, and as finally marketing director. And I think the the whole point. And when I joined WCT, we didn't have a marketing the marketing department. We had mm. we had a, one person who organised events and that and in those days it was one event a year the london wine fair now we've we've got a we've got a marketing team um of, of eight or nine people um and and to me marketing is so important because if you're going to grow a market you you've got you've got to get the right message across so the marketing message that we put across and of course marketing has changed in the 19 years since i was marketing director at seagram you know, the website had only just about been invented. Um, so digital marketing, which I've, I've I've got a fantastic marketing team um, at WCT all over the world. And, and of course, everything everything's done digitally now, whether it's through WeChat in China or other other platforms. So I think the, the main thing is, is that for, for us, it's, it's WCT is about learning, but you've got to you've got to market to the world. And that's for, to companies and so the sort of B2B stuff, but also to the consumers as to what it is WCT stands for, what you're going to get, what are the benefits are. Because as with any marketing, it's about if I'm going to spend this, yeah, what do I get? So so for us, that, that, that marketing effort is all about that. And it's it's if if I spend this or or I invest in training for my members of staff, this is what I'll get as a result of it. So so um so we, we that's why we've expanded our marketing team to us to the size it is amazing well thank you for sharing that i do want to ask you i'm conscious of the time because i know you have a call another 10 minutes but i am going to ask you about how wsct has adapted to the pandemic times what have been some of the challenges and what are the opportunities that one can look forward to now going forward okay uh, yeah i mean the, the, when the pandemic hit us and you know here we are it, what's the date of my computer the 10th of 10th of march it's literally 12 months it to the day is. 12 yeah. months to the day when we had to close our office we shut our school in london and we were already working on digital initiatives for education. So we already had what we call the online classroom. So you could do a, a, a course online, but it was a very small part of our total business. But then when the pandemic hit and in, a, in many countries in the world, going to a, a classroom face to face with the, with the pandemic, really hitting the world became more and more and more impossible uh it started obviously in china and then suddenly by this time last year the world had gone to a halt we weren't we were hardly running any classes as in in a classroom so we fast-tracked our digital uh offering so the we put more resource into our online classroom team so that's that took care of the educational side but then we fast-tracked the ability to do an examination online and this was a dream i'd had when i joined wsct 19 years ago that at some stage you would be able to sit in your own house as i am and do a wct exam and get a qualification so we've we we, we were already working on that but we fast-tracked because of uh, of the pandemic um it's only available at the moment in english and only at levels one and level two but we have investment in place to roll it out into other languages and also to um, increase the capability of doing your exam online at levels three and four. You could do education, you can do level three and level four in terms of online education. But uh, but we've got a digital first strategy with WSET and it's, it's, it's costing us quite a lot of money, but we're prepared to invest in it. Uh, and I'm really proud of the team that we've got in the WSET who've made it all happen in such a such a really short space of time and to be honest it it, it, it got us out of out of trouble when hardly anyone was doing a course in in particularly in april and early may and we introduced this whole end-to-end -end digital offering in the space of six weeks which was I, I must i up. must i must say this i'm in deep admiration of how quickly and how proactively you rolled out 
the, the digitization of your courses, including the exam taking. I mean, for most of us, you know, we just see, because one thing about the pandemic is we didn't know how long it would go on when it started. Yeah. Everybody thought, yeah. oh, it's going to be done in two months, you know, in two yeah, months. Yeah. Back to <laughs> so nobody yeah. knew, like back yeah. then in last March, who was thinking that even this March, we'd, we'd be talking digitally, yeah, and we couldn't yeah. be face to face, right? So yeah. nobody knew how long this was going to go on. And most organizations, uh, especially of the scale that, that WSCD is, could have, could have afforded to be complacent and say, well, let's wait it out. Let's just not offer anything. A lot of us locally did that, I have to admit. We didn't offer any courses for up to three months we said okay we're shut for business and so on yeah. but i just love how nimble footed um and agile wsad was you quickly adapted and then to think of the enormity of the task of having to roll this out across all the countries where you operate i'm sure was no easy feat so uh, my congratulations actually to you and the entire wsad team i i just want to also say that i i personally took a sake course as a student in the during the pandemic i so did i so did i i i, I, I <laughs> <laughs> I was just sitting, I was whiling my time and all I was doing was a few social media posts. So I thought, <laughs> what can I do with my time? I said, let me do a level one in sake. It's just yeah, I said, did I? So I, 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 I'm trying to find my certificate. I think I left my certificate in the office. Because oh, I, I wanted to try. Uh, but I, <laughs> and, you know, I thought, okay, let me, and, you know, it did give me a direct exposure into yeah. what the students go through, you know, when yes. they take an exam and so on and so forth. And um, I did that. And I have to say, it was just brilliant. My experience as a student was brilliant because the um, the platform, you know, the uh, the technology platform yeah. from where I was studying the courses, we had this person helping out. We could shoot <laughs> questions anytime yeah. we wanted to, uh, and the exam part was particularly so smoothly executed like and not to say it was flawless i mean i had to show my entire surroundings i had to show my ears <laughs> yes, I, yes. Below oh, my yes. Table, I had to show my yes. eyes i mean we had to do a 360 degree you know um, disclosure yes. of yes. what was around us and i thought it was so foolproof it was amazing i was so impressed actually um, it, it worked brilliantly it worked flawlessly there were no hiccups all a candidate needs to have is uninterrupted wi-fi and you're on, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's, it works. And now I, I'm going to ask you the question. I assume you passed the level one in some. I actually got a hundred out of hundred. <laughs> you beat me then. <laughs> <laughs> did you do the sake? I did. Yeah. Cause I wanted to try the, this, the, the exam system called remote invigilation. And I'd already done the diploma in wines and I'd done the level two in spirits. So I thought, I don't know much about sake. I'll, I'll, I'll pretend I'll be a student. So and I wanted to try it all out. So I did the level one in sake. Yeah. Uh, I, I did all the the. I probably didn't work quite as hard as you did, maybe. But uh, I but I did went through the classroom programs and and like you, when it came to the examination, I got my phone out and I. I'll tell you what might have helped me. I, my last trip before the pandemic broke was to Japan and so Tokyo. So I had lots of sake while I was there. Oh. So maybe that helped to some extent because I did a bit of, you know, learning about sake while I was yeah. there too. So, uh, so maybe that helps, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was great. And I wanted to now do the level three in sake, but I'm, I'm hoping to do it in London. So I'm waiting yeah. for things to open up a bit. And obviously London's first on my, on my list of places to visit. Um, this has been so amazing, Ian. If there's anything else you think you want to add and say to the Indian audiences, you're you're very welcome uh, to. But uh, otherwise, I've, I've pretty well, much done. Yeah, I just say I just say one thing, if I may. I do have to cut out on the phone. I'm sorry, I can't stay for the members of my team are, going, are going to be given in us the, like 40 in, minutes. We're we're that's on. That's fine. It. I mean, I just want to say thank you for inviting me. Is I I, I I'm. I'm I never need a second invitation to talk about WCT and to talk about the importance of education. So it was great to be invited, but also to say thank you to 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 you, Sonal, for everything that you do. But also, we, we do have educators across uh, India now, so we're looking forward to some really success, really uh, some great success in India. And and I and I and I hope you you you've all managed to stay relatively healthy in the teeth pandemic it's been pretty tough but i i'm an optimist and of course because i'm of a certain age i've already had my first vaccination in oh, my arm oh, oh yes oh yes so so i'm so hopefully i'll be i'll be secure but i just wanted to say thank you and and um and if if anybody wants to learn more about um about where they can study uh, for a wst qualification um 
you know, in India and anywhere around the world, just visit wctglobal.com and you'll find all the information you need there. But thank you so much for inviting me. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to be part of your Thank event. you, Ian. It's been such an honor. And thank you for never saying no, at least so far. So it's, <laughs> it's been brilliant. And thank you for being so honest. Uh, we, we no I mean, I'll be happy to let you go. We have two other people joining us who will talk about their personal experiences having studied from the WSET and how they've managed to shape their careers so brilliantly in different walks of life. So we have that up next. If, is it, and this is being recorded? So it's can all I, being recorded. So I'm going great. to send I, you the, the lovely. recording. I will, I will look forward to, to watching. I'm sorry I can't stay longer, but I wish, you all, I wish you all a great rest of the day. And I look forward to sharing a glass of wine with you, Sonal, and either in London or possibly. Very soon. Very soon. I look forward to that. As soon as we can. Thank you. Take care. You all the best. Bye, Bye for now. So that, my friends, was an amazing interview with Ian Harris, who's the chief executive officer of the global giant WSET, the foremost body in wine and spirits and sake education in the world. Uh, what we do have as a second part to the, as a continuum to this discussion is we've invited uh, a few, a couple actually of WSCT alumni or students or people who are pursuing their education from the WSCT and we're having a direct chat with them about how they feel they've benefited and also how how they've shaped their own careers because at the end of the day the, the purpose of this discussion today is to understand that there's a number of things that you can do once you have good education up your sleeve. So there are uh, various people who've done different things, but we have right now with us Ruma Singh, who is a is a full-time journalist, now a full-time writer and a columnist on wines. Ruma writes uh, features and columns for a bunch of mainstream publications and wine websites and is also blogging on her own blog site between the wine. 
is it wines or wines? Okay, between the wines. Ruma is also a member of the London-based Circle of Wine Writers, and she's currently pursuing her level four diploma, which is the flagship qualification at the London-based Wine and Spirits Education Trust. Prior to this, of course, she's done her level two and her level three. And may I say, at the level four, she's at the very last end. She has one paper to clear, which is going to clear as soon as this pandemic is behind us and travel permits. But Ruma, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sonal. It's nice to be here. It's wonderful to be here. I've been listening to all your sessions before this, and I hope everybody else has because they're absolutely fascinating. So, you know, Ruma, we also have Karan Vasani, who's the chief winemaker at Sula, who's going to join us uh, as well in a few minutes from now. What I'm trying to, what we're trying to discuss here today as a group is to say that doing education in wines is one thing, but I get emails every day, and I'm sure so do you, where students are always asking or professionals are always asking, how can I benefit from learning about wines? You know, if I study at the WSCT, what could I do with my career? So what I want to ask you is a more direct question, Ruma. How did you come to become a wine writer? Was it something you always knew you wanted to do? Or uh, you know, at, at what stage did you know this is where you want to be in this space? in wines? Well, Sonal, I have been a journalist all my working life, a lifestyle journalist. So during the course of my time with uh, National Level Daily, I used to do a lot of interviews. And yeah, so Bollywood actors, cricketers, rock stars, and among them were people I now regard as rock stars, people of the wine world were coming into India, among them being the late, great Stephen Spurrier uh, and several others, you know, great winemakers, people from wonderful countries with historic backgrounds. And every time I listened to them, I found it absolutely fascinating. You know, there's only that much you can write about everything else. Yes. But I found myself getting more and more interested in what they were telling me about wine. And I'd already started doing a couple of WSET courses. Wow. I just decided one day that I had enough of the media world as it was. And I decided I was going to quit. But what do I do? I write. What do I write about? I write about wine, which is by which time I had completely fallen in love with. It was a passion. And for me, at that stage, I just wanted to do what was my passion. Yeah. And here I am. So I kept studying and I kept writing. And that's where I am today. So did, you, did you just say that you, you are doing a lot of writing, which we all know, and you do amazing writing, by the way, guys. If you haven't visited our blog site, Between the Wines, you absolutely must and start following straight away. Uh, but Ruma... Uh, you, did you just say that you would also started doing a bit of education on the site, like teaching level one and two? Is that what, what I heard you say? Not formally, no, because yeah. I want somebody asks me, you know, at what temperature do you, uh, you know, store your wines? How do you hold your wine glass? How do you go to a restaurant and order? This uh -huh. is, I think, the fundamental education that is lacking in India at a very broad scale. Yeah. And people are afraid because, you know, wine is one of those hallowed things. So yeah. people think, oh, you really have to be an expert to know about it. Oh, my God. The amount of people who've told me, I can't serve wine to you because, you know, you will sneer at what I'm serving. No, I won't. But it's that perception. It's that perception which you have to bring down to earth. And the only way to do it really is education at whatever level, informal, formal so that is how I started and I continue to do, but I hope I will get into some more formal education and keep passing on the good word, so to speak, after my I love, I love the way you touch upon the word communication, because ultimately, whether you are doing it in, an, in, a, in a journalistic way on a blog or in a, on a column, and I'm doing it in the video way or someone else is doing it in a podcast way or some other is doing it in a, in a way where he's just standing and doing, you know, events and talking about wines. It's ultimately all about communication uh, and it's about communicating. And there's so much work that needs to be done in this sphere in wine because understanding a wine is so little, right? Do you find the consumer 
is starting to now understand a bit more about why and you think there's just still a lot 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 of work left to be done in a market like india well there is a lot of left to be done but i find the interest levels are growing exponentially just judging by the people who casually walk up to me talk to me or ask me questions i feel like this is a market that's waiting to just burst irrespective and as in your first session you talked about all the problems which we need to surmount and the issues the culture everything else but be that as it may it is still something which is just going to explode we just need to give the right uh, trifecta of of things for people to just latch on to quality uh, education communication and availability of course and i think it's just going to take off from there it's going to be a little sounds, slower than perhaps so optimistic. optimistic i love optimism i want to be optimistic you know i always so think well. i'm the only one who's wearing these rose tinted glasses because i often hear so many people be so negative about the indian wine industry and you know the pandemic hasn't helped obviously there's been this whole doom gloom sentiment that has set in but i for some reason still like to you know be very optimistic and i love it i love i love the energy you exude because you're always optimistic and i know every time we chat um you know we we feel that uh i am going to invite karan to join us into this discussion as well so we can make it a try party thing he's right here so allow me a second So Karan Wasani will join us in a in a few minutes from now. Ruma, back on to you. So, uh, so, in, so when you get asked this question by budding professionals, what could I do with my with my life, with my education, with my career? What do you sort of advise them they could do? What? How do with you the eat? wine career? Mm -hmm. I won't say it's an easy answer, Sonal, because right now, as you know, the industry is still a baby. literally i mean if you compare it to industries worldwide even if we talk about 30 years or whatever it is it's still a baby so there's a lot of things which need to fall into place before you can give that kind of widespread employment which it deserves sure. and i do not doubt for a minute that you have the talent we we have the talent and we have the talent in spades um i find so many levels of interest and it's not just a urban population of the big cities there's so many uh, youngsters from smaller towns who who are just so keen to learn more because it is such a fascinating subject you know that um what i do feel is it's going to take a little time for it to um for the education part to translate into jobs per se but there's absolutely no reason to stop learning whether it's formal or informal you need to keep learning because i can tell the difference of you know where i am today and the understanding i have if i go to barolo i go to germany i'm talking to a producer there is so much more i can bring to the table i when i do interviews i can talk with so much more authority the depth of the conversation is so much deeper you get understand and you know it excites you as somebody who studied wine to be able to 
uh, to be able to communicate that and to translate it and to let other people read about it, you know, because there's just so much to be communicated. And there's so much of interest in India. And that's something I find fascinating because I'm on Twitter and you'd be amazed at the kind of people who follow me on Twitter just to know more about India. And I wish I could tell them more. I want to tell them more. When we have good stories to tell, I'll be right up there telling them. But um, even now, I mean, I just love surprising people about India. And, uh, you know, the times when I take a bottle of wine from India, I open it up for my diploma classmates, and I tell them, guess where this is from? Napa Valley, Australia. And I said, no, this is from India. India makes wine. <laughs> yes, it does. And very good wine, too. Yeah. So get over uh, it. <laughs> you've, been, you, you've always been a great supporter for the Indian wine industry. So that's always a great thing. That's amazing, actually. Um, do you think you could have achieved that level of effortlessness or confidence? Uh, you know, we talked about, about a lot about confidence with Ian Harris earlier right now. Do you think you could have had or because you, you've been a writer even before, right? You, I mean, you're obviously good with words and that's why you're in that profession. Do you think you could have had that without the formal education in wines or do you think that's helped you? I consider? could have, I could have, but it was my choice to want to learn more and know more so I could communicate more. It's not necessary. I know a lot of writers who are not formally tutored or they haven't uh, studied to this level, no matter no matter what is important is you need to be passionate about the subject because you know if you're just looking at wine as a product you're talking about no can do no can do. you I have do. to be able to communicate it you have to feel for it you have to be able to put that out there so that people you know that infectious infectious feeling of excitement that picks up other people pick up yeah, you you touched upon the fact that there aren't very many jobs or you know jobs are are a bit thinned down at the moment because of what we've just been through. What about the prospects of becoming an entrepreneur? I mean, we work for ourselves, right? We don't work for anybody. Uh, what about the prospect of that? If someone comes to you, a young budding professional comes to you and says, um, advise me, Ruma, if I were to study about wines and get out there on my own, what could I do with my life? What sort of advice do you give young entrepreneurs? or budding entrepreneurs or, or I think India is the land of entrepreneurship and there's absolutely no stopping the talent that there is here and I think that is something we have in spades more than virtually any other country you can think of I mean you know we just think on our feet we learn to adjust to situations uh, we are so uh, you know on top of every situation that there is so I have no doubts there are going to be some fantastic ideas. There could be great apps. There's going to be ways of communicating that you and I haven't even thought of or think of discussing, which are going to come up in the next five years. And yes, they would need some amount of education. I don't deny that because there's nothing worse than passing on wrong information. And I see that all the time on the internet, yeah. that people just talk some... No, I, I, mean, I personally always thought India is such a land of opportunities right now and India is such a blank canvas at the moment, right? I mean, oh, yeah. when we look to the West and we see what all has been done with wine, whether it's in areas of uh, um, whatever it might be, I mean, you know, with events or running wine clubs or, or even writing or, or winemaking or marketing of wines or um, being some sort of a brand ambassador or running a trade commission office, you know, like a liaisoning office, whatever it might be. Uh, events like we've not even touched the tip of the iceberg when it comes to events which are in wine we yeah. still don't have proper wine festivals we don't have so there's so many opportunities that are still waiting to be tapped and done with right i remember when i started india wine awards ruma this was one such opportunity i looked to the west and i thought oh these kind of things exist but there's nothing like this in india why don't i start india wine awards and you've been such an integral and a significant part of that that story for us but you know before we even knew it, we'd run three successful editions of India Wine Awards. So in that sense, I, I constantly find myself advising young budding professionals that, you know, find what your strength is, find what you enjoy doing best day and night. And what do you inherently, you believe you're good at? And then just find a way to utilize that skill set. And it, sometimes I find that the industry is also not important or the 
um, you know, the activity is important. The skill is important. So if your skill set is talking, for example, then do some talking, you know, whether it's standing up in front of an audience and doing that or public speaking or, or making videos or whatever it is. But if your skill is talking, then do some talking about wine. Or if your skill is writing, then do some writing about wine. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I totally agree. And as the Indian wine industry grows, there are going to be more and more opportunities. There's going to be more and more things happening, uh, you know, more and more excitement. I was recently at, uh, Grover Zampa and I was very excited with the sort of stuff that they were doing because it just shows that there is the interest within the industry to push yeah. things at a different level, push yes. things up and make everything world class. And, you know, we do have our problems as you discussed, you know, our taxes, our policies. But in spite of that, if we get the sort of growth that we are getting, I think world is our oyster five, ten years down the line. Yeah, we are getting some good growth, as you know. You know, we are growing at fifteen percent year on year for the last few years now. But I think, given that we're operating on a on a smaller base, we probably deserve a, a, a even higher level of growth or a faster level of growth in wine. I agree. Which can I mean, only come, yeah, yeah. No, if no. we didn't have the problems that we have, which we face, I think our growth would be at least double of that, at least. Yeah, and that is bearing in mind that we are not really a, a country which has a long wine drinking culture. We are not Europe. We are not, you know, uh, but at the same time, it's just that whole interest and that whole fascination for the new subject and interest in health and interest in so many other things which are just coming together perfectly. Agreed. Tell us about, um, if, if I were to ask you, when you look around you with what's going on in India and what everybody's doing, where do you fi- feel there's a big opportunity to do something that's not been done either well or it's not being done at all or you feel it's not being done enough of? Um, you know, when you compare with what is happening globally, where do you, you know, think of it as, as an advice you would give to somebody who's just started out. Where would you say, you know, what are the areas we're not doing enough of? Again, it comes down to communication. We have, well, a few, a handful of wine producers. We have a handful of communicators and everybody is doing their bit. But we need to bring more consumers into the picture. Mm-hmm. However, we communicate to the consumer, like you've, you've got your retail, you're doing your videos, whatever it is, we need to broaden that base. Because there is, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there's a certain hesitancy, there's a certain fear, okay, I'm going to be spending, you know, whatever on a bottle of wine, will I look stupid when I drink it? No, you will not. So you give the reassurance. And when it comes from a level of expertise, when it comes from somebody they think is giving them the right advice, they will take it. So I think at the communicator level, there is a lot of opportunity. There is a ton of opportunity. And um how you do it, whether it's through an app or whether it's through a website, whether you do classes, I think there is a lot that can be done there. And of course, the rest has to fall into place and then everything sort of multiplies by 100. Yeah, I do have one final question, Ruma. You touched upon and we talked a lot about communication, which is so important. It's at the core of everything that we're trying to do with wine. But if you look at the global wine trade, and it's often something I think about. I, if you look at the global wine trade, a vast majority of professionals around the world, they talk to the trade. So what I mean is, um, if I'm a writer, not you, of course, I'm just saying, but I, if I'm a writer, I'm writing articles that are being read, read by the trade. So it's like, you know, we still remain like a small circle of people. I write for you and you write for me and we're all just reading each other, but we're not going beyond. Nobody's writing for the cons- <coughs> excuse me. No one's writing for the consumer. Nobody's going beyond the trade circle to talk to the consumer. Uh, do you feel that? Do you, do you get that a lot, in, particularly in the developed yeah. matured markets? And um, consumer is so important, right? How do we... Um, you know, because a lot of the professionals also tend to feel that if I'm dumbing down the subject too much, 
I'm kind of almost mm. belittling myself, you know. Like I shouldn't be talking about how to swirl wine in my glass. I should really be talking mm. about the terroir of uh, mm. uh, Central Otago. Yeah, I, I'm mm. just fresh in my mind because New Zealand's mm. nice. But mm. you know, it's like uh, everybody just wants to over intellectualize because it's an ego feeding exercise. It's it's you know it makes me look good. Yeah, yeah. So people are scared. People are insecure to dumb mm. down wine because they feel it makes them look dumb. What are your thoughts on this? It's not dumbing down. You know, everybody needs to. You will not talk to a child in nursery or grade one at the same level you talk to a PhD student. It doesn't mean you're talking down. You're dumbing down. You need to communicate, and if if they don't understand what you're saying, it makes no difference. I mean, most of them would not understand what you meant by terroir. So why talk over their heads? And then that builds on the whole concept that. wine is something which i don't think i want to know anything about because it's too difficult so tell them that if you swirl your wine in a glass this is what it does to the wine it yeah. just opens things up it you know it's a, you know oxygen it opens up yeah. the aromas blah, blah, blah. Yeah. and then and then that's that's exactly what happens hey karan <laughs> karan's here hey karan you're here now hello so sorry no worries Uh, I'm not sure we have too much time left before our next session, but I, I'm, I'm do, I am very keen to quickly introduce you and and uh, throw in a few questions towards you, Karan. So, Karan, uh, my friends, is the chief winemaker at Sula Vineyards, and he's also the assistant vice president, AVP Vineyard Operations. He has switched careers from finance to wine making, so that's interesting. And after doing some elementary level courses in wine uh, in India from the WSET, Karan studied viticulture and enology in. much detail from the Lincoln University in New Zealand he has also worked at wineries in New Zealand and in Napa Valley how fascinating karan tell us about your journey very quickly from finance to wine how did this come to you thank you sonal for that lovely introduction uh great to be here sorry for being a little bit late it's winter season so things are a bit crazy at the moment i can imagine um, the journey has been quite an interesting one i I fell in love with wine. Uh I was actually supposed to do an MBA but was drinking too much wine. And uh I think things just flowed organically and I was looking for something different to do. And I think the stars were aligned. And fantastic. It's been a wonderful 10 years in the wine industry and I couldn't imagine going back. So we're talking to uh, a lot of budding professionals okay people who who are hospitality students or who are starting out in wines of course a lot of people are already very established in wines but the idea is to talk about how we can shape our careers and so for you was there a moment when you knew this was your calling this is this is what you wanted to do um how did you know you were in the right place right time i think i was interested in wine and i knew that's what i wanted to do because i love the product and then everything for, for me the stars had just been aligned you know i was supposed to go abroad to do another internship and that fell through because of visa issues and there was a job at sula and i've not looked back since so it, things have been brilliant that way yeah no it's pretty amazing was that level 1 or level 2 when you were in my classroom at one point that was level 1 in 2010 so here's the thing right i mean i i you know it's been a while i've done a level 1 myself in the sense i've taken one i don't i don't teach at level 1 anymore but um, i remember way way back we did the level 1 and karan was in my class and then obviously i wasn't in touch i didn't i didn't see him for a while next thing i know is he's this cheap wine maker at sula and i'm like <laughs> how did he get there like what just happened there and you know and then we met again and and karan was like yeah oh, i went to the desert but to me this is a perfect example of how somebody just sets foot put his foot on the pedal doesn't take his foot off the pedal just kind of strides along and you know you must have pretty much done all your education bang 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 very swiftly right pretty much am i correct within 18 months within 18 months how long was your course uh, to study wine making at Lin- at lincoln university a year a year okay so yeah. tell t- for those of us who are listening in tell us for those of us who want to be wine makers two things mm-hmm. one where can they study apart right. from where you also study from but two mm-hmm. uh, what is the skill set they need to have what should they look out how do they know they can be a good wine maker what do they need to have within them to know they can be a good wine maker 
Okay, so let me ask the second part first. Okay. Uh, I think you need curiosity, uh, a sense of you know, an appreciation for good food and wine. I think that is critical, uh, and passion for the product because it really is a lifestyle choice. You have to live and breathe wine. So, and in terms of where to study, I think there are amazing schools the world over. What I would say is for someone from India, with English being the best and the easiest, uh, you know, it's something all of us are very comfortable with. It makes the new world easier. America, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Europe has some phenomenal schools, but then if you don't know the language, you've got to invest time in learning the language, which can take another year, year and a half. So that becomes a challenge. So, Karan, how much would you say in percentage terms is your knowledge coming from books that you use today, and how much of it is learning on the spot, on the ground uh, <laughs> experience in percentage so, terms in the in the whole scheme of things? Frankly, I would say seventy five percent is learned on the job in the field, and twenty five percent is you know theory, and that serves as a backup, and you know just about enough to. If you run into an issue, you know where to where the technical resources are that you need to look up. Yeah, and especially over here in India, you know where we face challenges that so many people, uh, so many winemakers in other countries don't face. We're a very unique environment when it comes to making wine. So yeah. we're learning on the ground. There's yeah, nowhere else. We touched like we touched upon that in the previous uh, session actually, where Ravi Vishwanathan, the chairman of uh, Grover Zampa Vineyards said that one of our challenges among many of course and god knows how many challenges we do have but one of them is also the tropical viticulture um, yes. for our viewers just tell very very succinctly what is the main core challenge of tropical viticulture lots of challenges i think the uh, the biggest thing is that our grapes growing season is upside down our grapes actually ripen over winter and we harvest before summer yeah uh, so despite being in the northern hemisphere we follow a southern hemisphere cycle so that brings its own set of challenges and the monsoon and the high humidity of a tropical climate make it especially challenging in terms of managing diseases in the vineyards hmm. yes can india ever make an organic wine 100% organic i mean of course with so2 use just to the to the permissible limit but can we actually do it with lower levels of so2 i mean we could do it but what the pricing would be and whether it would be commercially viable Mm. I think that's the challenge, right? We could do it, uh, but it, I don't think it would be commercially viable at any reasonable price point, and you would never do any reasonable volumes. It, it right. could be done as a nice passion project. Yeah, yeah. One question to both of you now uh, is: uh, How do you? How do we keep updated with our knowledge every day? Like you know, because the world changes, things come, things go. Um, how do you find yourself keeping up with what's going on around the world? Karan, you first. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Uma. I think just, you know, there are so many wonderful resources today uh, with, within the industry and so many, uh, from a technical perspective, there's so much great information, whether it's the Australian Wine Research Institute, whether, you know, it's the American Society of Enology and Viticulture. Again, a lot of English-focused stuff there is, of course, great stuff from coming from Europe as well. It's difficult to access uh, given the language barriers. But there are so many wonderful resources and a lot of it is just free on YouTube. It's amazing. It's yeah. so easy, actually. Really? So somebody could just go online on YouTube and watch a lot of videos on winemaking and actually learn? Yes. I mean, the especially the Australian Wine Research Institute has an amazing YouTube channel with phenomenal content out there. Oh, very okay. technical, uh, yeah. very good stuff. And then there are lots of journals and publications that you can subscribe to as well, which, and it's easy actually to stay updated these days. Because you've studied from New Zealand, do you find your style of winemaking influenced by New Zealand styles of wines? I mean, it's good news if it is, but I'm just asking. <laughs> I think, of course, I mean, you know, you have that little bit, like it's where I studied. So for me, it's sort of like wine home. But I think when you start making wine in India, you very quickly realize that if you have to make it successful here, you have to adapt to the local conditions.
conditions. And you are suiting Indian conditions. That's the only way you will succeed. Amazing. Listen, guys, I'm so sorry, but we have our next uh, speaker already in the waiting room. I wish I could have talked. Uh, Ruma, did I? Sorry, we. I, I wanted to. Uh, I wanted you to answer the question. I'm going to say pretty much we more on. of what Karan said, which is the resources available online are mind blowing. I mean, right through this whole uh, pandemic, lockdown, whatever it is, there were webinars. There's, you know, websites. There's YouTube. There's, there's, there's aren't enough hours in the day where you can just immerse yourself in learning wine at different levels, or just yeah. reading. There are books, great books, fiction yeah. <laughs> on yeah. wine. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, there is. The, the world is your oyster if you're interested and uh, and let's not and let's not forget the what you can do with travel like how much oh, you yeah. can learn just through travel meeting oh, I just people love travel. Asking, I can't and i wait. say asking questions you yeah. know asking questions there's so much one can learn from just meeting totally. people asking questions doesn't matter stupid questions intelligent questions doesn't yeah, matter yeah. But just you know having a curious mind karan you touched upon that you know passion curiosity a continuous strive to keep growing you know so uh, i just want to congratulate you both um, it's an amazing feeling to be part of this industry with you both i wish we could have gone on much much longer uh, and there were so many other things we could have talked about like karan i would have loved to talk about the differences you're making at sula which are evident by the way in the glass but uh, but i would wish i could have talked more about that but unfortunately we must we must cut short here on this on this session but let's organize this again on another day and speak at length how about that absolutely any time amazing well thank you again for your time and take care speak soon see you bye bye thank you the kind of ceo who likes to put on a show here's a show stopper that happens to be a decanter introducing the hosting collection by shaze shine by design
Uh, welcome back. That was our amazing session on how to build careers in the wine industry and how education can help you shape this career. Next up, we have Spotlight on New Zealand. Why New Zealand? Because, well, New Zealand's an exciting wine producing country and its preeminent importance in the wine world is particularly noteworthy for three main reasons. One, its rapid and successful transformation from wool, meat and dairy led industry to a powerful player in the wine industry in a relatively short period of time, more so spurred beyond the 1980s onwards, is completely completely admirable. Second, New Zealand is perceived among the premium winemaking regions of the world. Uh, in the MW Master of Wine Circles at Blind Tastings, we often refer to New Zealand wines as those that offer a lot of purity, elegance, and high quality. That's how we generally tend to argue when we describe New Zealand wines. So New Zealand wines have a stellar reputation and generally a positioning of being at the premium end of the market, regardless of where they might be in terms of price points. Three, the taste of New Zealand wines is so distinctive. Most of its initial success rests on the immense popularity of the New Zealand uh, Sauvignon Blanc, which is coming across all regions of New Zealand, but more so from the sunny uh, side of Marlboro. Uh, but now equally staggering is how New Zealand has built its reputation for producing quality world-class Pinot Noirs. Uh, it's, you know, Pinot Noir is another jewel in the New Zealand crown. And not only are these wines distinctive, but are also changing the way the world enjoys a Sauvignon Blanc and a Pinot Noir. Now, we're here to learn about all about New Zealand wines, but we have somebody who's going to do this for us. We have to help us navigate through the world of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. We have Jim Robertson, who will lead us through an interesting masterclass to help us understand the magic of New Zealand wines. Robert, uh, Jim Robertson is Pono Ricard's global wine ambassador. He has spent time around the world learning about wine, teaching about wines, and sharing New Zealand wine insights with Pono Ricard's distribution companies, distributors, trade, media consumers. In short, he is fully equipped and has all the knowledge you need to know about New Zealand wine. So we will be paying over the next 30 minutes a pre-recorded but a fantastically engaging masterclass on New Zealand wines, particularly seen through the eyes of Branker Estate. So please watch this masterclass and I will be back after the masterclass to do a tasting of the Branker Estate Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir wines where we will discuss what is the distinctive style of the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. I'll see you very soon, but please hang in there and watch this wonderful masterclass presented to you by Jim Robertson, the global wine ambassador at Pono Ricard, bringing you wines from Branker Estate. Cheers. Good evening, India. Uh, my name is Jim Robertson, and I am delighted and very thankful to Sunil Holland and um, uh, her Wine Academy for the invitation to uh, present uh, a masterclass uh, on New Zealand for you um, during the um, uh, Wine Knowledge Summit. Uh, without further ado, uh, I will uh, take you on a tour of my country. Um, first and foremost, a, a lot of people ask me, you know, where is New Zealand, particularly when I'm traveling in the Northern Hemisphere? And I always say to them that, that we live, grow grapes and make wine at the edge of the earth. And the next stop after New Zealand is Antarctica and the penguins. We are situated in the uh, Southern Hemisphere global wine belt. Our latitudes are very similar to those of Italy. Uh, and our climate is similar to either Bordeaux or Burgundy, but um, much cooler because of the maritime influence. Um, if you've been to a restaurant lately or you've uh, gone to your favourite uh, retailer uh, to look for a bottle of New Zealand wine, quite often it's hard to find. And there's a very good reason for that. Uh, New Zealand produces less than 1% of the world's total annual wine production. So you have to look hard for us. You have to be a big fan of New Zealand wine in order to um, seek us out, but that is slowly changing. And I'm, I, I'm delighted that um, more and more people are making friends with New Zealand wine uh, on a global basis and particularly in India. 
Um, how do we fit in terms of the, uh, the, the world of wine? Uh, last year, New Zealand exported 31 million cases of wine uh, globally, 31 million cases of wine. Um, and for the first time, our exports of, of wine exceeded $2 billion. And that makes wine exports out of New Zealand the fifth most valuable um, commodity exported out of the country of New Zealand. Um, we've also created the uh, arguably the most notable new wine style of the 20th century in Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, but more of those, more of that later. Um, and we uh, are very, very conscious of our responsibility to the environment, uh, and we have a, a philosophy of, of of leaving our environment in a better state than than when we inherited it. And just on your right there, you can see an example of our sustainable practices. Uh, we run sheep in our vineyards uh, during the winter. Uh, they help uh, keep the grass down. They provide nutrients to the soil. Uh, and then in spring, uh, they do a wonderful job of leaf plucking. They will eat the leaves uh, off the, uh, the vines, particularly around the fruit zone, exposing the, the bunches of grapes to uh, the sunlight to help with, uh, with with ripening, but it's very important that we get the sheep out of the vineyards before Verazon, otherwise they would probably eat the grapes as well. Uh, just a very quick um, uh, uh, bit of history: um, the, the first recorded grapes arri uh, vines rather arrived, arriving in New Zealand was in 1819, with the Reverend uh, Samuel Marsden who brought in. Uh, grape vines uh, to plant for um, uh, sacramental wine. Uh, in the 1830s, James Busby uh, produced the, the, the first recorded wine. And in fact, to this day, that um, we still have one of the original tasting notes from Dumont uh, uh, Durville, a French explorer, uh, which is a light white wine, very sparkling and delicious to taste. And I, I'm pleased to say that um, that uh, theme has continued through to today. Um, uh, Bishop Pompelier and his missionaries traveled throughout New Zealand in the 1850s, and they took cuttings with them to um, what are now some of our more established wine regions. Uh, if I jump forward to 1885, um, the government commissioned a um, well-known uh, viticulturist, Romeo Brigato, uh, to do a study on the potential for viticulture in New Zealand. And he wrote in his, um, in his report that New Zealand as a country was eminently suited to viticulture. And here we are 100 plus years later, and um, that uh, summary of his findings uh, has proven to be quite true. A major milestone in the development of the New Zealand industry was in 1973, when um, uh, Montana, now Pernod Ricard, uh, bought and planted the first Sauvignon Bach of Pinot Noir in Marlborough. And in 1979, the world tried Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc for the very first time. And I believe Sanel will be tasting you on the 2019. Uh, so, you know, in essence, a uh, a 40-year-old wine, uh, sorry, a wine that we've only made 40 times in our lifetime. Compare that to the French, the Italians, the Spanish, the Germans who've been making wines for hundreds and uh, possibly thousands of years. So we're a very, very young wine-producing region. Now, where does all this come from? It comes from a wonderful country. Uh, as you can see, in the uh, on the map on the uh, the, the right hand side, uh, New Zealand is made up of two uh, major islands, North and the South Island. Uh, Fifteen hundred kilometres from the from the north to the south, um, and within that area, uh, a, a, a ten uh, grape growing regions. What is important is that the 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 width of the country is no more than uh, about five hundred less than 500 kilometers. So the maritime influence plays a huge part in the way um, 
uh, our grapes ripen, the way um, our wines taste and, and the stylistics, and a little bit more about that as we, as we go through. So of those 10 wine regions, there are really four that I want to talk to you about today. We don't have the time tonight to go into all 10, but I want to talk to you about four really important ones. I want to talk to you about um, uh, Marlborough in the first instance, uh, which accounts for just under 78% of all the wine produced in New Zealand, and Marlborough is at the top of the, of the South Island. I want to talk to you about Hawke's Bay, which is halfway up the east coast of the North Island, uh, at just under 10%. I want to talk to you about Gisborne, which is about three hours car drive north of, of Hawke's Bay. And last but not least, I want to talk to you about Central Otago, um, which uh, is the most southern, currently the most southern wine region in the world. Uh, but more on that when we when we deep dive into the regions. Uh, those 10 uh, wine regions uh, cover just on 40,000 hectares, and those 40,000 hectares deliver 450,000 tonnes. And to put that into a global perspective, uh, Australia, our, our near neighbour, uh, last year crushed 1.7 million tonnes of grapes, and California crushed 3.2 million tonnes. So we are a boutique wine producing country that focuses on value as opposed to volume. Very important um, uh, note. So let's um, let's have a bit of a, a, a drive or fly over and look at our, our regions. And I'm gonna start from the north uh, at Gisborne. So halfway up the, uh, the east coast of the North Island. And you'll notice that the region is right on the coast, right in Poverty Bay here. Um, Gisborne is also important for another another um, point, and that is it's the first um, region in the world where the, where the grapes see the first light of day. And by that, I mean that the um, international date line is not far off the coast. And so the sun rises uh, there and the, the vines and the grapes of Gisborne are the first in the world to get the light or the sun of the new day, which I think is a kind of a cool thing. Um, the, the, the the plain is separated by the uh, the river that runs through the middle of the uh, uh, the plain, uh, and the key grape growing areas would be the 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 Golden Slopes uh, and um, uh, the Ormond Valley, where we get some lovely, rich, ripe. Um, really um, full-bodied um, Chardonnays. And then if we go across the other side of the valley into the Patutahi side, uh, what we tend to find there are things like uh, Pinot Gris and Gewürztraminer uh, growing very, very well. Um, you talk to uh, any New Zealander and you ask them what Gisborne is famous for, and they'll tell you that Gisborne is the Chardonnay capital uh, of New Zealand. Uh, the Chardonnay capital of New Zealand. And if you look at the, 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 the breakdown of the varietals, it's led by, by Chardonnay, uh, which I, I mentioned to you from, from the northern side of the valley. Uh, and then it's followed by the, the Pinot Gris and the Gewürztraminas, which are in that, that Parutahi, which is sort of on the southwestern side of the valley. Not a lot of red wine in this area. This is very much a white wine producing area. A little bit of Merlot, but that, that is decreasing each year and more is going to Chardonnay and into Pinot Gris uh, and a little bit more into Gewürztraminer. Then if we drive three hours south, we will get to uh, the Hawke's Bay. And when we talk Hawke's Bay, you immediately think of the Rhone and Bordeaux. And again, like Gisborne, on the eastern seaboard, very maritime, another another coastal uh, wine growing region. Um, and as I said, um, very famous for Bordeaux style and Rhone style wines, but they also have a very, very strong uh, Chardonnay program. And the bulk of the Chardonnay that comes out of the Hawke's Bay or top Chardonnay will come out of this sort of Tiwanga area 
uh, or the Tukituk. And the, the Tukituki River brings down uh, lots of clay, brings out a lot of limestone, um, and so you end up with, with wines that have much more structure, much more weight, and a much more textural um, versus the, the, you know, the fullness and the ripeness of, of, um, uh, of Gisborne. Um, but really, this is the area here that um, Hawke's Bay is, is most famous for. Uh, and the Gimlet Gravels, very, very uh, hot area uh, in the region, so a little further inland, very flat. Um, and protected on both sides by the by the the, the hills and mountain ranges, uh, and so there you get um, terrific merlot. Uh, get a little bit of cabernet, but it's it's it really is best known for its uh, for its for its merlot. Um, and then if you move to the to the next little microclimate, which is called the Bridge Par Triangle, this is where you get some of the very best Syrah um, and very good cabernet. And the Cabernet here has got a lot of a lot of structure, a lot of texture. Um, grapes that produce wines with with really, you know, uh, uh, quite weighty but fine grain tannins. And if you're looking for a, a Sauvignon Blanc, uh, you have to go all the way up uh, uh, to the Crownthorpe Terraces, which are really a long way inland, uh, elevated at about four five hundred uh, uh, meters, and there you get. Uh, Sauvignon Blancs that are more in the Bordeaux Blanc style. So, um, you know, a little bit more, you know, tropical notes uh, and certainly, you know, quite a bit of, of barrel fermentation and barrel maturation influence. Uh, and the wines are very, very, very textural and, and got a lot of structure and, and a lot of ageability to them, uh, which is different to uh, the, the other regions that we will cover. So when you look at the uh, the, the makeup of um, of the Hawke's Bay, uh, you'll see the reds uh, re are really quite dominant, uh, with with the Merlot being the, the lead red. Uh, the Cabernet is is only at 250 um, hectares, and 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 Syrah at 300, but that's growing rapidly. The Syrah is now up to uh, up to about 450 hectares, I believe, from memory. Um, and then obviously you've got the Chardonnay. Um, uh, in those two coastal um, uh, uh, microclimates in uh, Tukituki and uh, uh, Tuanga. And then the, the Sauvignon Blanc that was up in the valley, uh, a Crown Thorpe, uh, and a bit of Pinot Gris coming through there as well. Uh, by the way, um, uh, folks, uh, this presentation will be available to you um, from Sanal uh, on an ongoing basis. So. If you're interested in, in picking up a copy and studying it at, at your leisure, um, it will be made available to you. So don't worry about not being able to uh, keep up with um, uh, with me. Now, what I've done is I've, uh, I've, I've loaded, us, loaded us all into an aeroplane and we've flown um, from the North Island across the Cook Strait, which separates uh, the North and the South Island, all the way down to the Deep South to Central Otago. And of our 10 um, wine growing regions, nine of them are maritime influence. In other words, they are on the coast. You can actually see in some instances, hear the waves. Central Otago is our only continental climate. Um, you know, long, sorry, very uh, hot, um, high heat degree days, um, relatively short growing uh, ripening season. Uh, and then very, very cold winters. Um, the Central Otago area uh, is known as our action adventure capital. Um, and some of you have, have got to know it quite well. If you've watched Lord of the Rings, if you've watched uh, a couple of Tom Cruise's um, Mission Impossible movies, all the mountain scenes are shot in this particular area, whether it's in the summer or in the winter. So you've actually been to, to Central Otago, but didn't know it. Um, and the first uh, Pinot Noir uh, sub-region of, of Central Otago is Gibston Valley, the first planted. And then from there, uh, and it's the coolest of the sub-regions. And then it, everything kind of moved up the, up the valley here, up the Cromwell Valley. Uh, and as you move further north, um, the, the valley broadens out and you get a little bit more heat, uh, longer grain to gaze. So the wines tend to be 
much bigger, richer, more textural. A uh, lot of wild um, herbs growing in the hills, so thyme, sage, some of those things. So the, the, the wines do pick up some of those those, those sort of spicy aromas. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about, about that um, when we talk about um, uh, varietal styles. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the most southern wine region in the world currently um, and the only uh, continental climate uh, within the New Zealand wine region uh, network. And as you can see from this slide, the, the power of Pinot Noir is, is, is very evident. Um, almost, you know, um, single dimensional, in fact. Um, and then um, lovely uh, Pinot Gris. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, of Central Otago Riesling. Tend to be dry, quite slaty, uh, nice minerality showing through. It reminds me of some of the, some of the European um, style Rieslings. So, um, and, and, and a little bit of Chardonnay, but, but really um, Central Otago is, is all about uh, Pinot Noir. And last but not least, um, the engine room. Uh, and we'll spend a bit of time here for very obvious reasons that, you know, just under 80% of the New Zealand wine um, region, it, it's worth um, um, spending a bit of time there. So here we are, um, uh, right at the northeast tip of the South Island, um, Cloudy Bay, again, maritime influenced. Uh, two major um, uh, uh, valleys, the Wairau Valley, which was the original, um, uh, valley, and then the newer Awa Tree Valley here. Again, uh, rivers running through both uh, um, regions, uh, and we've got a, a wonderful um, what we call the Southern Valleys, which are little finger valleys that run through here. That I'll, I'll talk a little bit more um, uh, about just uh, very shortly. Um, oops, and there we go. And if you look at um, uh, at the power and the impact of Marlborough. Uh, you can see there that um, uh, of the uh, 40,000 hectares in New Zealand, 27,000 of those, or nearly 28,000 of those hectares are actually in Marlborough. Uh, and you've got your Sauvignon Blanc, um, which is 22,000 hectares out of the 27. So again, a bit like Central Otago, where it was Pinot Noir dominated, Marlborough, Sauvignon Blanc dominated. Then you've got Pinot Noir, followed by Pinot Gris, uh, and some some good Chardonnay starting to come out of um, out of Marlborough. Right now, Jancis Robertson is is quite um, a fan of um, uh, those Chardonnays. And um, just you know, in terms of 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 the, the Marlborough styles. Um, I won't go with them to too much depth and detail because I will be talking about the Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir specifically, uh, and they really are the drivers. Those two wines represent about 90% of what is exported uh, internationally, and they're probably the wines that are most on your wine list or on your retail shelves in India. So a little bit more about that. How did Marlborough um, start? Um, Perna Rica, which is now, um, sorry, Montana Wines, which is now Perna Rica, uh, pioneered um, the uh, Marlborough and bought the um, bought land in 1973 um, and um, planted um, Sauvignon Blanc and, and, um, uh, and Pinot Noir um, there. Um, there's 27,000 hectares on the vines, as I said earlier on, so 70% of all the vineyards in New Zealand uh, come come from Marlborough, um, and of the 450,000 tons that we crushed uh, uh, for the 2000, so yeah, for the 2020 um, uh, vintage, um, 340,000 of that um, comes from Marlborough. So literally only 100,000 across the rest of the country. So really, the engine room and the driver. Um, and there's just a couple of historical photos of, of um, we didn't have a lot of labour, uh, a very small region actually, just on 20,000 people um, uh, back then. And so these were husbands, wives, partners, um, you know, uncles, aunties, nieces, children who helped us plant um, 
uh, Brancot Estate, which is a, a vineyard of about um, oh, about 500 hectares uh, in round figures. Um, no irrigation, so we had um, people driving through the vineyard on tractors uh, and hoses and then literally hand-watering the, um, the vines in order to get them to grow in, uh, in that area. Um, I just wanted to show you this, this photo here. When our founder bought uh, the land, he was interviewed by the local newspaper and he had bought um, a sheep farm. This was originally a sheep farm. And when the editor of the Marlborough Express asked Frank why he bought the land and they were standing in the middle of a, of a paddock with sheep running around, no vines anywhere in Marlborough. And Frank's words in 1973, September 1973, was wines from here will become world famous. And that's um, now um, uh, memorialized on that uh, sculpture in the vineyard. And this is the exact place where the first Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc was planted and it was on, on our vineyard. Um, just a couple of quick things, Oz Clark, um, when he first tasted um, uh, Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, was really blown away. He didn't quite know how to describe it. Um, you know, um, brash, unexpected, gooseberries, passion fruit, lime, crunchy asparagus. Um, and what I liked was the rest of the world has been trying to copy it ever since. Um, you can only make Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc or Marlborough Pinot Noir in Marlborough, as we all know. Um, same thing in any other wine region of the world. Um, what I want to do here now is I just want to show you uh, a little bit about Marlborough because Sonella is going to taste, taste the wines with you. But what I want to do is to, to give you a little bit of insight so that when you're tasting the wines with her, you've got this a mental picture in your mind. Right now, both the two wines that you'll be tasting, the Brancot Classic Sauvignon Blanc and the Brancot Classic Pinot Noir, are what we call a Marlborough Regional Blend. And the circles that I've outlined here represent the three different sub-regions of Marlborough, and they all have specific personalities, all right? So what you get out of um, the, the, the Northern Wairau, the, the Wairau Valley, which is the warmest suburb Appalachian, is a lot of tropical notes. So it's your passion fruit, it's your pink grapefruit, um, uh, you know, there's a little bit of uh, sometimes a little bit of white nectarine or white peach in there. And the wines seem to be a little bit lighter and more elegant. The acidity is not as, as pronounced. Then you go to the, to the southern valleys and it's only 10 kilometers. And the southern valleys, um, the wines become more herbal. So you get a lot of gooseberry and bell pepper, um, lemongrass. Uh, and the wines, because they, they, they're grown on, on heavier clay soils um, uh, and, and, and a cooler area, you tend to get a lot more weight and a lot more texture. And then if you come down here to the most southern, which is right on the coast, and our, our vineyards are right down in here, um, you get this wonderful, crisp, jazzy, bracing acidity uh, and this lovely structure. So as a winemaker, what we do is we blend from these three sub appellations and you'll go through that whole sensory experience with Chanel but what I wanted you to do was to understand where they come from. So 40% 40, 40 of the grapes come from the Awa Tree Valley, your freshness, your crispness, your acidity. 30% uh, comes from the Southern Valleys, the weight, the texture um, and another 30% comes from the Northern Wairau which is a lovely lifted aromatics um, and your elegance. So we blend those together to give you a wine that has a lovely balance and harmony. Um, and so um, I, I know that you'll enjoy it very much. And just to give you a picture of the, of the three places where the wines come from, uh, this is the, the Rapara. And as you can see, it's, a, it's an old riverbed with lots of stones. And those stones go right down to you know, two or three meters. So the soils are very, very light. Um, very um, um, light in nourishment, don't hold a lot of um, nutrients, uh, and so the vines really have to uh, really have to struggle. 
this is Brancot, uh, the Brancot Vineyard, the, uh, w- which we first planted the Sauvignon Blancs on. Um, and you can see there the clay soils are much heavier clays. So there's your there's your weight, your texture, your body, um, and your mid palate weight. And then uh, the Arwateri um, is a bit of a combination of both. So you've got this windblown loess, you've got the the, the, the sort of the river, stones, river, rock, and then you've got this sort of hard uh, papa in here. Um, and one of the most beautiful wine regions in New Zealand, as you can see from that photo. And then what I've done is I've, I've done a little sort of, this is how we break up the, uh, the, the diversity between subregions. And uh, when you taste the wines, I'm sure you guys will have a lot of fun uh, trying to identify the, the, the nuances um, and, and pick up where the elements uh, come from. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil the, the wonderful tasting you're going to have with Sennel. Um, moving on to, to, to Pinot Noir, and really, really important point here. There's no other country in the world that has this kind of red wine dynamic. New Zealand's total crush of red wine is 67% Pinot Noir. And in fact, five, and I think almost close to to seven now, of the 10 wine regions in New Zealand produce good quality Pinot Noir. There's no other country. Yes, there are regions where Pinot Noir, as Sonoma in California, or or obviously Burgundy, or um, Adelaide Hills, or, or the Yarra Valley in Australia. There are pockets of Pinot Noir grown in other countries around the world, but nobody has 67% of their red wine being being one great variety and that and, and, and especially Pinot Noir. So we're very, very unique in that um, in that sense. And that is because we are a cool climate wine producing country. And Pinot is a, is the red wine that we can consistently ripen well in New Zealand. And as I said to you before, Syrah Merlot and Cabernet really only happen in the, that Hawke's Bay area. Um, it's our major uh, grape variety, 7% of the total harvest. Right? Um, what is interesting, and people don't realise this, is that over 50% of all the Pinot Noir grown in New Zealand actually comes out of Marlborough. But 20% of that goes into our sparkling wine programme. Right? goes into our sparkling wine program. Um, and um, uh, if you look at Central Otago, 76% of all the Pinot, of all the grapes grown in, in Central Otago are Pinot Noir grapes, right? which is why I, I put um, uh, Central Otago in that little um, uh, graph I showed you. So quite important to, to get that, that insight. And then if I, I, I break it out by... By Sal- I know I didn't do this for the Sauvignon Blancs because really it's 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 ninety percent Marlborough, but I have done for the uh, for the Pinot, uh, and I've broken out Hawke's Bay, Wipra, Nelson, um, the ones that I would recommend that you focus on would be Marlborough, Central Otago, and Wire Wrapper, and those are the three. The Wire Wrapper we consider to be the, the oldest of our, our Pinot Noir regions and probably the most Burgundian of uh, the lot. Um, Marlborough tends to be sort of midpoint um, and then central Otago uh, down in the south um, where I've talked about Gibston Valley and I've talked about Bannockburn, Loburn, uh, where the wines are fuller, a uh, little, little bit more tannin structure and lots of, of dark fruit and those notes of dried dried herbs and, and, and you know, the thyme and, and sage and that from the hills. So it's all there for you. Um, you can you can further explore this at your uh, leisure because I, I know time is, is important. Um, and I've, again, I've summarized um, those key um, regions for you. Um, but you compare Marlborough to Central Otago and, you know, it's certainly a much, much bigger proposition. And again, just like I've done for the Sauvignon Blanc, the Pinot Noir that you're going to taste, the Brancot um, classic Pinot Noir, is a regional sub, um, uh, uh, sub-regional blend, I should say. 
Uh, again, the Wairau in the north, the southern valleys, and the Awateri. And again, to break it down, um, you've got the fragrance um, and the, the, the red cherries um, and spice uh, and the softer, supple tannins from the Wairau. Um, from the southern valleys, you've got a little bit more concentration. The, the, the fruit spectrum is getting a little bit darker now. Um, and there you, you're getting the palate weight and a little bit more, little bit more texture um, coming through. And then the Awatree Valley tends to move. I, I always say it moves into that sort of red spectrum where you've got, you know, the raspberry, the cranberry, sort of that, that sweet, sour kind of thing happening. Um, but you are getting some, some dried herbs there as well. Um, but you're also getting some nice, um, nice tannin and some nice, some nice Christmas with the, a bit of a city coming through. So again, um, Sonal will be able to talk you through that in the tasting, and do explore and do tease out, um, you know what what aromas you, you're picking up from the sub regions, what what flavors you're picking up, and what textures, and try and try and put them into the the sort of sub-regional um, areas. And just to summarise, uh, I, 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 I'm a very jealously guard time, uh, just to summarise, New Zealand is a, a niche producer of high-value, expressive, cool-climate wines. Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir are our two key varietals, and both have a very distinctive personality in the world of wines. And by that, I mean they're not readily replicated by other wine-producing countries or wine-producing regions, and that is important. And the most important thing from my perspective is that we're a very young wine-producing country. And, you know, as I said to you, the wine that you'll be tasting, I believe it's a 2019 vintage. So as winemakers, we've only had 40 attempts to perfect our crafts. So my my advice to you is to keep a close eye on it because the best is yet to come. So uh, on behalf of, of all my co wine making colleagues in New Zealand, I thank you for being part of um, uh, Sonal Holland's um, Wine Academy. Thank you for being part of the, the, uh, the, the Knowledge Summit. Um, I wish you well. Uh, I thank you for your interest in New Zealand wine. And um, from us in New Zealand, um, be safe, stay well, um, and, and cheers to you. Wow, wow, and wow. What a deeply enriching discourse and a deep dive into New Zealand and its various wine regions. Thank you. Jim Robertson for such an enthralling, engaging and deeply knowledgeable and enriching session on New Zealand wines. I am sure all of you have learned many things and your knowledge and understanding of New Zealand wines is deeply enriched after this incredible masterclass. What remains to be done though, is after all of this teaching, I don't know about you, but worse, I'm certainly thirsty. We're gonna taste some wine, so I have a glass of the Branket Estate Sauvignon Blanc here, right here in front of me, as well as the Branket Estate Pinot Noir. So I'm going to taste both these wines and we'll, you know, just kind of have a quick description. So, like I said, you know, New Zealand has such a distinctive style. Um, New Zealand makes less than 1% of the world wines, but it's still known as the Sauvignon Blanc capital of the world. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's something to learn from, right? That's something to learn about and, and sort of be, um, be, be inspired by because um, New Zealand has created such a signature Sauvignon Blanc style, which is now sort of preferred by consumers as opposed to Sauvignon Blancs made from anywhere else in the world. And they're just so distinctive. Um, typical, you know, typically it's jaw-dropping, herbaceous or floral aromas. But before I get to that, this lovely sort of a straw color wine that's here, it's got some glistening gold. It's just lovely. It's really very inviting. On the nose, there is this very distinctive, unique, herbaceous and 
floral aroma but because it's from marlboro and marlboro region is kind of enjoys a bit of the sunny microclimate it's got a ripe nose it's got this ripeness it's not very herbaceous it is in fact you know i get some sort of notes of pineapple intermingling a lot of citrus lemon um there's this lovely florality to it um maybe even sort of edging towards a little bit of the dried mango you know the tropical sort of aromas coming through distinctively on the wine and on the palate the wine's just so refreshing uh it's got this lovely mouth watering acidity which is signature of sauvignon blancs but particularly so for the ones that come out of new zealand they are you know what i like about new zealand sauvignon blancs is that they always have such great definition you know the the linearity of the wine along with the suppleness and plentiful fruit that exists on the side it just kind of makes the wine really delicious you know that's the word that comes to my mind on the flavors i get a lot of freshly cut grass some bell peppers but lots of guava again guava is so signature to you know a uh, a sauvignon blanc particularly the one that comes from the marlboro little bit of gooseberries there's lots of the lemony zingy flavor that comes through my mouth is watering even as i speak because it's got this lovely clean uplifting finish so to me this wine is really you know sort of um straightforward but incredibly enjoyable very ripe and round and you know one can keep taking a sip one after the other and not really tire of the wine because it's really a refreshing wine it's a perfect wine to have you know when you're when you're having a hot day or a really tiring day and you're looking for something to just sort of uplift your senses uh now onto the pinot noir and pinot noir again is so distinctive in new zealand the uh, pinot noir style of new zealand has kind of really built a benchmark style for itself uh as opposed to the pinot noir that comes out of burgundy from france or from anywhere else in the world new zealand wines are you know they are light but at the same time they are very complex and this is a great combination when you're looking for a wine to be compatible with food especially where you know you want to it's light enough to pair with white meats and it's complex enough to actually stand up to some red meat in any case guys you know when it comes to food and wine pairing there is no such thing as white meat and white wine red meat and red wine but i think one wine that really plays to the gallery when it comes to versatility of pairing with a number of dishes whether they are vegetarian or non vegetarian and in the non vegetarian whether they are white meat or red meat is one such wine which comes with that tremendous compatible you know sort of versatility is pinot noir let's take a let's take a look at this pinot noir this one's again branker estate pinot noir from marlboro region and to me this is like it's light in color it's not got a very deep hue uh but it's the perfect ruby you know it's like it's it's beautiful it's just glistening in my glass it's lovely and bright ruby um and although it's light it's it's very very inviting in terms of aromas you get this lovely red fruit rather than black fruit so it's kind of red strawberries cherries red plums uh, raspberries so a lot of this red fruit spectrum that sort of comes through there's a hint of you know some sweet fennel kind of coming through like a spice and yeah just you know uh, there's a lovely sort of rose like uh, elegance to it some florality that's sitting right at the top of the glass so it's kind of you know really again a very inviting nose let's take a sip very subtle acidity for those of you who don't like your teeth to go gnawing at each other because of the high acidity in wines and some pinot noirs can be like that particularly the ones that come from very cool climates this particular one has a really soft rounded subtle acidity the tannins are really silky you don't feel any amount of that dryness 
or a stringency and that is mainly because there's a lot of ripeness in this wine the 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 fruit is ripe very ripe and um, almost like sweet now when i say sweet i don't mean the residual sweetness like the sugary sweet but there's a ripeness that is making the fruit kind of sweet and rounded and smooth to taste so the wine overall goes down really enjoyably and kind of lures you into taking another sip uh again it's it's uh, it's got a lot of purity to it very nice clean expression uh the finish is you know kind of there it's not very complex but to me both these wines represent a brilliant example of what a benchmark marlboro region wine should taste like ranker estate to my mind sort of epitomizes the original taste of marlboro of course marlboro as a region has evolved because of its stupendous success in the wine world and so you'll find today lots of wine producers producing different styles you know so you'll find more deeper more extracted styles some may you overuse oak or do a bit more oak and so on but you know if you just really want to see where marlboro region started and what is the original taste of marlboro what is a textbook example to me the branker estate wines represent that both these wines are incredibly compatible with food i can easily see how we can enjoy them with good indian cuisine uh, and like i said they're light enough to pair with you know a white meat like a salmon or a chicken and at the same time they're complex enough you know is particularly the pinot noir to sort of pair with red meats as well but there are several foods you know i think the best thing i can say about its compatibility is sometimes you just go with wines that are widely compatible with a, with a wide range of foods so if you're at a banquet or you're at someone's home or you're pouring this in your home and there's lots of different food being served ranging from cheeses and nuts all the way up to some kind of curried you know heavy main dishes and everything that comes in between like salads or pies or um uh, you know snacky fried items or whatever it is that is on the table if there's a wide variety of foods being served then these are two wines that would be incredibly compatible and enjoyable with those kind of foods because the sauvignon blanc is lovely and aromatic and you know it's kind of um instantly attractive on the palate because it speaks to you it's very expressive and the pinot noir is just you know subtle not in the face but ripe and round and smooth and incredibly easy drinking so to me you know that's the taste of the branker estate um uh, marlboro region sauvignon blanc and pinot noir um and i guess with that tasting we've come to the end of today's knowledge summit i hope you have all benefited from some of the knowledge that you have gained from this evening please do write in to us with your comments some of you asked if these videos are going to be available uh, and yes the truth is that these videos are all being pre-recorded so they're all going to be playing on sonal holland wine tv channel uh, on a separate playlist called the sonal holland wine wine academy knowledge summit so look out for them if you've missed out today's sessions or some of your friends have please do invite them to come and watch and before we go i want to remind you we're back again tomorrow for another engaging session we have three amazing sessions lined up for you to learn from the first one is where we talk about the evolving indian wine consumer palate what is it that indian consumers like when they drink their wines what is their palate what do they enjoy and how is this evolving what are some of the grape varieties of the future that you, we think indian wine consumers may you know enjoy drinking in, you know in the more immediate future and in years to come so what is the taste and what is the palate of the indian wine consumer next up we have a session with um well i we have some amazing speakers who I'll introduce tomorrow but an, an amazing session on fine wine investments this is all the rage everyone's talking about can wine be used as an investment tool can it be used to make money so tomorrow we're talking to a leading a uh, fine wine investment company who will tell us and teach us everything we need to know about investing in fine wines do's don'ts 
how to go about it without losing money and in fact make some money out of it and third up we have a deep exploration and an engaging panel discussion with some iconic napa valley producers so first part of that is going to be me making a a presentation on napa valley wines and looking at you know the different ada's appellations of napa valley and understanding napa valley more in depth followed by an engaging chat dialogue with three incredibly iconic napa valley premium producers so tomorrow is another power pack day you're going to have lots of fun and we kick off tomorrow at 6 or 6:15 please look out for it on the newsletter you've got but 6 o'clock i would say just be there uh, waiting to start the live at about 6 p.m. and uh, here's to another fun evening tomorrow so don't miss out let your friends know who missed out today to look out for tomorrow and i'll see you again tomorrow evening lots of love good night and take care see you tomorrow For the part-time bonsai artist who's a full-time investment banker. Here's a piece of art that happens to be a decanter. Introducing the hosting collection by Shazay. Shine by design.